September 14th, Council Meeting is going over. Will you please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance and moment of silence? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. First item on the agenda will be approval of the minutes from the August 24th meeting. Move to approve the minutes from August 24th, 2020. Second. Second. Nancy, one correction. It needs to be made. I talked to the back about it. And there's a, a motion and a second by the same okay. person. Okay. So, uh, it's been a motion and a second to approve the minutes. Would the clerk please call the roll? Kahar? With the modification. Yes, sir. Kahar? Yes. Malott? Yes. Driver? Yes. Stites? Yes. Adams? Yes. Next item will be statement of bills paid in amount of $459,078.78. Mr. Mayor, make a motion to approve the statement of bills in the amount of $459,078.78. Seven. I know, I yeah. <laughs> Second. Okay, it has been moved and second to approve the statement of the bill made. Would the clerk please call the roll? Kahar? Yes. Malak? Yes. Shriver? Yes. Stites? Yes. Adams? Yes. Next item on the agenda will be press or comments from the public. Would you please go to the podium, state your name and address, and you have three minutes. John Oliver, 10601 Shawnee in Edwardsville. I'm a member of the Planning Commission. And I'd like to preface my remarks by saying our commission is very cohesive. We have an excellent staff. And one of the reasons that I've come here this evening is because one of the issues you have on your docket, the, the request for a 3-3 for the Jackson service station, is probably the first controversial thing we've had on our commission in the entire time that I've sat there. Uh, it's unique in that, and not only that, but also in the fact that this was the first issue that's come before us where the people requesting the change didn't show up. So, several problems with it that I see. One is it's a poor location for what they're requesting. They're asking for a truck stop within a short distance from the stoplight. There, it's a short distance, it's going to be noisy. So it's a short distance over the tracks to the mobile home park. It's really, I think the lot is too small for what they're trying to accomplish there. They're going to have to eliminate half of their consumer gas pumps to allow for traffic in to get around to the other side. And so as much as we'd all love to see that one lot cleaned up, I don't think this is a project for it. The only argument I've really heard for it is that, well, if we give them this zoning change, we can keep track that they've got to jump through a lot of hurdles down the road before they can actually create something here. That's not a good argument to me for the simple fact that once we give them the zoning change, we've opened Pandora's box. From there, if this falls through, there are other undesirable projects that can be put forth and we won't have as much ammunition to go against them as we do now. I might, if, if you agree with that it's a good project, I might agree with you in, from the sense that had they come forward, had they gone to DOT, had they brought something to us and said, look, we've gone to DOT, we've got permission for the trucks to enter the highway, if they'd given us something, anything, but they've given us nothing. So all we have is a pig and a poke here. Give us the C3, and maybe we'll come up with something someday. And I don't think that's adequate enough for your support. Thank you for your time. Thank you, John. Are there any others? OK, if not, we'll move on to the next time on the agenda. We'll be consider a motion to go into executive session in accordance with KSA 75 4319 B2. 
for consultation with legal counsel regarding information which would be deemed privileged in the attorney-client relationship related to the village south at a Rizzo project. How long do we need? 15 minutes, so we probably can be back to the left. 20 after? Yes. Okay. Uh, what the mayor said, coming back at 20 after. Second. It has been moved and seconded to go into executive session until 720. Would the clerk please call roll? Kehart? Yes. Malott? Yes. Shriver? Yes. Stites? Yes. Adams? Yes.
three subject to final review, which is typical. The technical reviewers just make sure all the wording and the signature blocks are accurate. And then meeting the submittal and filing uh, requirements of the UG and the county survey. With that, I stand ready for any questions. Is this one that we just split into two fronts here, Will, you know? No. I'm trying to think what you might be referring to. We have south side. Yeah, we've had on the south side. And when we did that on the south side, we also got right away along Richland okay. at the same time. Different owners? Different parts. Yes. <laughs> there are so Aaron Hart owns part of this lot and she yeah. also is a co owner of the lots I think that you're thinking of that were three five. Yeah, so the names are relatively familiar. Okay, not mysterious. And do you know what their um, goal is or their purpose in the well, my understanding, the property on 102nd Street was in the process of trying to sell that property, but they wanted to reduce the size of that acreage. There was another buyer behind Aaron's property on Richland that was interested in purchasing that property. So there's some transference of ownership going on in that process. I don't know the details of that. That's not part of their application. Do you know if that, all the water is on that one lot? property line doesn't go I, through the water, does it? I don't think it goes through the water. I'm pretty sure that it's actually west. Yeah, I think they so went it looks like west. Yeah. yeah, I think they're west of the pond on that. Yeah. And, and we've gotten, yeah. they are. Yeah. gotten right away Sorry. on 102nd and also along Richland. Yes. Right. And then the access through, through the cold sack. Correct. Which had to effectively come off of what is now lot three. So the ownership of that parcel had to dedicate right the sufficient right of way for the road as well as on the street. And of course, that pushed the back property line farther back to meet the minimum five acre requirements. So all three lots meet our zoning requirement for minimum five acres. And, and what are the restrictions on the road? The 103rd court terrace? The right Yeah, there's no restrictions on it. Right. It's construction standards or anything? It has to be our standard. Yeah, right. 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 Once it's built as a public street, okay. it can dedicate for public use. At the time they give a house is built, then they will have to construct that public street for public safety standards. Okay. They never house. build a house. They want to access it for the other parcels. That's that's the norm. So they have any kind of a you know, agreement between the property owners to go back and forth. That we don't care. But it can't be used for a public access. It's a city owned property for the dedication, just like any other roadway. So it can only be used in the streets. Do we need a motion uh, for both? Uh, replat and then another for final, correct? No, just so one I'll motion. One. I make a motion to accept the approval of the planning commission regarding replat and plat, final plat for 10326 Richland and 316 South 102nd with the four uh, listed commissions. Second. It has been moved and second to adopt the, um, to approve the Planning Commission's recommendation on the replat final plat of 103 26 Richmond and 316 South 102nd Street with the four conditions. Would the clerk please call roll? Kahar? Yes. Malak? Yes. Shriver? Yes. Stipe? Yes. Adams? Yes. McTaggart? Yes. Next item is, will be a consider recommendation or approval of Planning Commission regarding the preliminary and final development plans for proposed transportation center at 9207-9233 Wood End Road. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Um, I won't go over the addresses again. This is an application for a preliminary plan and a final development plan. Uh, so it'll require two motions tonight, one for approval of the preliminary plan and one for approval of the final development plan. On July 1st, the applicant filed their preliminary plan and final plan applications for a transportation center on approximately 4.4 acres of land on the south side of Wood End near the I-435 interchange. This is what was known as the Kincaid property. 
in case uh, Coach Lines was using this property. It's actually two parcels. That's why you have the two addresses. Um, the parcel line divides the property roughly in half as it's currently platted. Um, to date, the property is zoned I-1, non-hazard uh, zoning district, which allows for the proposed use as a transportation center. Uh, the owner has made some improvements to the existing building in the northeast corner of the property. So the, the building that is on wood end in the northeast corner, there's a little gate that comes in the drive and then that building that sits right there. There have been an exterior and interior improvements made to that building um, to date. They have received a temporary uh, business license and occupancy license for using that building and that's why You'll see the dot food trucks have been going in and out of there using that facility currently. They're in allowed use. The issue here is, is they want to expand the area for parking and they also want to demo, uh, demolish some of the buildings that are on site already. So they're basically cleaning up the property. We'll be dealing with some stormwater improvements, things like that, landscape improvements as part of the development plan process. Um, so those improvements to that building have been made and the plan is for that building to stay on the site. Like I said, the temporary occupancy permit and business license have been issued to the tenant and they've begun utilizing the existing paved area and building for the initial operation. The development plan primarily addresses the demolition of existing structures and expansion of the paved area of the property, as I mentioned before. On August 19th, the Planning Commission held their public hearing in regard to the items. The staff and representatives of the application spoke at the public hearing. Um, there were no comments from the public in regard to objections to the project itself. So in closing, staff supports the recommendation of the Planning Commission for approval of the preliminary development plan and the final development plan with the exceptions and de exemptions and deviations and four conditions included in the staff report. Um, I'll just kind of go over those quickly. Uh, we are asking for greater details related to the fuel tank and the dumpster enclosure, just making sure that they're con uh, consistent with the architecture of the building and things like that on site, knowing where they are, some of the dimensions. So there were some basic things that we wanted to make sure of, and also just making sure that that uh, area is adequately screened to meet our applicable requirements. The second condition has to do with the signage. If you look at the plan sheets, the way the signage is located would not be acceptable. It's in public right of way. It's not on private property. So they're going to be subject to getting a signed permit application into us, and at that point in time, we'll review the location of the sign. Uh, I believe the applicant is aware of that, and all we need to do is just make sure through this condition that they understand they have to get their sign permit, and I'll have to bring those plans forward and adjust them. Um, then third, that separate interest instruments dedicating additional right-of-way along 93rd Street south of the current entry drive and an additional 10-foot drainage easement along the west side of the property um, shall be developed, executed, and filed. So the applicant has already agreed to doing those as separate instruments. Because we're not replatting the property, we want to get those drainage easements in place so that'll happen through a separate agreement, through a separate uh, dedication, if you will. And then just subject to the applicable <coughs> federal, state, and local regulations, acquiring appropriate uh, permits. So, with that, I stand ready for questions. Can we talk about the deviations? Oh, I can mention, yeah, sorry about that. I'll just mention there are three deviations that have been um, requested on this, and they're primarily reductions of rear and side setbacks, primarily because they're trying to get enough parking area that they can park trailers, but also have truck maneuvering on the property itself. So when they started laying out all the truck diagrams that are in your packet and things, um, the request for the rear parking setback is a reduction from 20 feet to 10 feet, and then on the side parking setback from 10 feet to 7 feet, and then finally the increase of the maximum lot coverage we allow in our industrial area of 50% coverage, they're requesting 86% coverage. The stormwater calculation is everything take care of the drainage side of this, and it should work okay. And I'll just mention in our industrial area, in that portion of the city, it's pretty routine that we have those exceptions in regard to lot coverage because we're dealing with a lot of truck traffic and movements of concrete and things like that. Dave, I just want to clarify, uh, the, the first motion is to approve the preliminary development plan. Correct. The no. second motion is to 
approve the final development plan with, with the exemptions. With the exceptions okay. and the conditions, deviations and conditions. Yes. Thank you. On the conditions, it just says that you would like the details related to the fuel tank and dumpster. If they bring you the details and they're not adequate, they'll have to meet our standards, okay. which basically all we're really interested in really is that screening and then the material of the dumpster screening area. A lot of times we won't accept like a wooden gate. It'd have to be a metal gate. They'll have to be, you know, probably concrete block or something like that, more substantial than just chain link fence because we're trying to screen the service area. But I believe that the applicants, I think, are aware of those conditions or at least those uh, needs that you need to know. The transportation center, is that um, like where trucks will park or yes. gas? So my my understanding of this, and I think the applicants here, I'm right behind you. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> um, turn them all over. Um, I'll try to give it a rough example. Essentially what's happening here is um, a truck will come in, drop a trailer, a new driver with a new truck will pick that trailer up. So it's a transfer. It's kind of like the Martin Transport Center that they've got. They will have one, one or two bays. I can't remember. It's two bays that will allow for some minor maintenance, like oil changes and things like that. But those are inside that building that would be on the northeast part of the property. So it's got some offices. Then it's that transport. You know, basically it's a, it's a transfer station. Is that fair? Dave, I have a question. Okay. And actually, it's more of a, um, uh, to let you know, it's not a fueling center. There, won't no. be any, oh, yeah. there will be no fueling outside. Is there a thought process of leaving it two plots instead of combining them into one? Well, if we were building another building and everything else, we would come back through the replatting process. Because of the nature of what they're doing, demolishing the building, the, the actual building that's there that's going to be demolished in the center of the site is split right now by that property. That's being removed, so it's just surface area. Um, in the long run, replatting, under what I would consider the, the next advice step would be to plat this as one parcel, if that's the desire of the owner. Uh, but it's not a requirement for this development. If we had a new building coming in, we would definitely be looking at that because we require that new building to hit the setbacks mm -hmm. off of that property line that divides the two parcels. So the parking area, we don't have that issue. It's and under you, one ownership. Yeah, and just for, as it sits today, unless something's changed, the owner of the property is not changing. Right. So uh, Kincaid, uh, Michael Kincaid, business name owns that property and so at this point it's a lease scenario with documents though I think there's been some discussion and you know future possibility that they would acquire I mean, our discussions with them this is actually the only facility they have where they actually have a lease most all of their other facilities that they have around the country uh, are owned facilities so this is a little different that could or could happen with nothing prior to do that. Reference that, that Doc Foods is not the owner of the property. They are tenant of the property. Not unusual. We have a number of facilities in the electrical park that are not owned by the owner. If I could make one comment. Please. If you'll come up and just take names to get the record, please. Absolutely. So, my name is David Fenton. I'm the Senior Transportation Manager for Dot Foods. Um, I want to re refer to Chuck's comment about the fueling station. These are refrigerated units, so we will have a fuel tank on site to top off our, our briefer units that are running these are frozen loads, refrigerated loads. Those are, we'll be contracting to World Services. World Fuel Services, these are certified approved tanks that are monitored very carefully, have monitoring systems on them. We have in our design a spot for those tanks. They'll be above ground. They'll be fenced, so you won't be able to see those from the road around there. So. And now also have a secondary containment correct. system, correct? Yes, yeah, secondary containment. I mean, there, it's, it's a. We've, we've been down the show before, so they're right. They're very approved certified tanks. So I want to throw that comment out there. Thank you. Thank you. I'd almost tell you the above ground tanks are the preferred over underground tanks. And uh, had a few of those in my days in municipal work. Where we have large enough fleet that we did, we use the above ground tanks because 
And the good thing about an above ground tank, number one, it's a tank that has a concrete structure. So if the tank fails, you still got a concrete structure. Number two, when things are underground, you don't always know they're leaking until it's too late. So uh, there's a lot of pluses, I would say, other than you seal uh, to, to that system. The other, the other nice thing in this location is that it doesn't get affected by groundwater level changes because it's so close to the river. We could have that water table shifting, and so anchoring those underground tanks and things like that can cause shifting in and out. So this is, it's nicer to have it above ground. Mr. Mayor, I make a motion that we approve the preliminary development plan for 9207. And 233 William Road with the four stipulations as recommended by the Planning Commission. Second. And moved in second to approve the preliminary development plan for 9207 and 9233 William Road. Would the clerk please call the vote? Kahar? Yes. Malak? Yes. Shriver? Yes. Stites? I'm going to recuse myself. Adams? Yes. McTaggart? Yes. motion for the final development plan with the proposed Mr. Mayor, I make a motion that we uh, adopt the final development or accept the final development plan for 9207 and 233 Wood End Road. Uh, would those same stipulations apply to the final as to the yeah. To the yeah, I would just make sure your motion includes those conditions and the deviations as shown in the okay, in okay including those four items recommended by the planning commission and of those deviations mentioned in the presentation. Second. It's been a motion and a second to approve the final development plans with the stipulations mentioned. Would the clerk please call the roll? Kahar? Yes. Malak? Yes. Shriver? Yes. Stites? Again, I need to review himself. Adams? Yes. McCack? Yes. Next item on the agenda is we consider a recommendation of, of, of approval from the Planning Commission regarding an application to rezone property at 10625 1035 Paul Drive, adopt ordinance number 1031, finalizing the same. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, I'll just correct one thing. There is a typo in that recommendation. It's 10625 and 10635 Paul Drive. Sorry about that. Um, with that, um, this is the old Jackson's BP site, if you're familiar with that. So um, these are two parcels of property there, one that has the convenience store and fueling on it, and the other one, which is the vacant property just to the east of the Jackson's convenience store. Um, on July 1, 2020, the property owner filed an application to rezone the land at those two addresses to C3 General Commercial. It is currently zoned C2, which is commercial retail. Uh, the area proposed to be rezoned is two parcels consisting of approximately 2.4 acres overall. Um, it is, as I mentioned before, the property is currently used for service station, convenience store, and parking purposes. Um, what's triggering the rezoning request is that the applicant who will have to come forward with a preliminary and final development plan as part of this process is wanting to introduce diesel fuel and truck services for that piece. Um, also, the current service station part, the repair part, that kind of piece, is technically considered a non-conforming use right now. It's legal because it was established under the old zoning code under C2. We now require that that has a C3 zone. So they could operate just the way they are as a non-conforming service station or repair station from that sense. But that triggers a whole other series of issues if they come in to expand things. So we felt it was better for them to come forward and ask for the rezoning to C3, take care of that non-conformity, but also what they're proposing with some of the truck uses may potentially need that C3 zoning in the future too. So um, that's the reason behind the, the rezoning proposal. We also suggested as staff that they go through the rezoning process first before providing their development plan because if there was no desire by the city to actually rezone the property, there would be no sense in spending what would be considerable amounts of money developing a preliminary plan and a final development plan 
if the rezoning were rejected. So that's why it's coming in in a stepped process. So you're getting the rezoning first, they will have to come back with a development plan, which will again be reviewed by the Planning Commission by yourselves. So if there's any questions on that process, just let me know. Um, on August 19th, the Planning Commission uh, held a public hearing in regard to the item. City staff and one individual spoke at the public hearing. There were no objections uh, to the proposed use as part of that public hearing, and there have been no protest petitions received by the city in regard to this item. Uh, it's important to note that the Planning Commission discussed the item and took action on two motions. So I'm going to just clarify this. The first motion was to deny the rezoning request. Okay? That motion failed. Okay? Well, the failure of a motion to deny does not mean that the Planning Commission is approving or recommending approval of the rezoning. It just simply means that they did not pass a motion for denial of the request. So then they took a second motion, which was to approve the rezoning. That motion passed. So the Planning Commission did pass a motion three to two, split vote on the rezoning of this property from C2 to C3 as part of their recommendation. So, so a second motion was made because it was a tie at two to two. Well, no, it was a two-three vote. The first motion was to do not or to recommend denial of the rezoning request. And that was, that was two to two. It was two to three. That's so two it two failed. Two to three. Two to two. So it was a two two to three. There were five members voting. Two voted for the motion to deny. Three voted against the motion to deny. So it failed, didn't pass. So then a second motion was brought forward to approve. That motion passed three to two. So it just reversed? Yes. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. But, but we want to make sure in the record, you always want to make sure in the record, is that really the recommendation? Just because a motion failed does not necessarily mean that they're rejecting it or approving something else. So you do that second step to ensure are you really saying you want to approve or recommend approval of this? I will say that part of the concern was um, with the C3 zoning, it does open up other uses of greater intensity to be on that property than what C2 would limit it to. So the Planning Commission had some concerns about, had some discussion about, do we really want to open up that opportunity to some of these other uses? What I will say as part of this process in the, in the draft ordinance as part of this process is we have two reversionary conditions that go with our rezoning. Because we require a development plan in this process, basically those two reversionary pieces, and I'm going to go to them very quickly here if I can find it. Dave, how many members are on the planning commission? There are seven, seven total. So we have five of the seven there. So there was two, half one. Correct. I believe that's correct. No? I was looking for Katie. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's correct. I believe What's that's correct. Is it, yeah. What's the history of attendance at the Planning Commission meeting? Uh, we're, we're pretty good. Pretty, pretty solid. Yeah. I mean, there, there have been, I, I think we checked last year. We, I don't know if it up this year. And we had a number of meetings where we just didn't have any activity. Yeah, this is uh, a hybrid meeting or virtual? This was, in this was in person. Yeah. This was an in person. Right. And so, uh, generally speaking, uh, I mean, there's there have been people missing for various reasons. I, I don't know that anybody missed more than two meetings last year. My, my two more. cents worth is this should go back to the planning commission. The last person that I didn't have enough time to look at it to make them, but I think would be a good decision. Well, they well, the processes. So let, let's talk about two things so that we, we do that. I'll, I'll address that item. Let me address first what's going on here, too, because the Planning Commission, their legitimate concern has to do with that growing intensity of uses. So what I want to do is make sure that the council understands that even if you approve this ordinance tonight, any change to zoning is not going to be published until there's an approved development plan. So we have, a re we have a reversionary condition that requires that the development plan has to come forward in this zoning district, in the C3 zoning district, 
So they'd have to do kind of what Doc Foods has done tonight, bring forward a preliminary and a final plan. They're also going to have to plaque the problem. So they would have to bring that forward within the next 12 months. If there's a failure to get something passed on that development plan, the rezoning reverts back to C2. So it's caught in this kind of, I'm going to call it a procedural limbo, if you will, because the concern that the Planning Commission has is a legitimate concern. They don't necessarily want that greater intensity of use. But if the property is designed right, they may say, okay, it's now limited to these uses under these conditions with this plan. So that may take that concern away, or it may not. It just depends. Um, so I just want you to be aware of your, if you approve the rezoning tonight, it's not like it turns around and the map gets republished tomorrow with that new zone. It will hold until we have a development plan that's approved. So that's one thing I just want to make sure people understand. Usually we get this all as one thing if it's a solid development coming forward. In this case, with a small business person, we just felt if there's no desire to rezone, we didn't want them spending the money that it would take to do the development plans just to get projected. Are there any other C3s right around there? Are no, the only C3 there? property we have is up at the hotel site up at I-70 I and 110th Street. So with the there is other C2. Yeah. On, on the corridor, and you also, in the comprehensive plan and the K-32 study, both of which have been through, it indicates that the desire is to have commercial uses along K-32. Okay, so that's kind of where we're working from is there's a commercial desire, but it's a, what uses do you really want and where is that? Right, and that, that was something that I, I mean, I don't know if this is the right time to talk about it or not, but when we're thinking big picture and we're thinking 10 years down the road, what are we wanting that corridor to look like? And if we're wanting it to be a safe place for people to ride bikes, you know, we've got um, the Ruger Brew bike run that goes from right. Kansas City to Lawrence down K-32. Is that the best place that we want semi-trucks pulling out? Have we done any safety studies or anything to, to see if that would be the best? I, the, the studies that I'm aware of along K-32 are pretty general. So the K-32 study does indicate potential future pedestrian use, bike trail, those kinds of things along the corridor. Um, so that is in the study, um, and that could be something. So I'm going to go back to um, Councilman Malott's question at this point and say that could be a reason that you want the Planning Commission to look closer at those studies and consider the case a little further in light of that information. That could be a reason to go back. So. If we're going back to Planning Commission, we, we do need kind of some direction as to what we're wanting the Planning Commission to look at. I'm kind of thinking about the uh, Leavenworth Commission approving the, the mining operation or the dredging operation in DeSoto that's supposed to be transporting raw sand through Edgerville, which would almost have to be 32 highways, which they predicted 200 trucks a day. Trucks a day which would have to be 400 trucks a day because they got to, when they come in, they got to go back. Hauling those raw materials on this highway, but we're trying to improve things around here and to have that increased traffic. Uh, I think it needs to go back and those considerations need to be discussed by the planning commission and then brought back. And if there's other options for the C3 C zoning, then you know, we need to look at something like that. So. What are the other hoops that they would have to go through to to do this development just the way it's drawn? Well, the way it's drawn, and this is always the confusing part, right? Because when they're coming for a rezoning, what we try to ask them to do is provide the city with a concept of what they're wanting to do. Okay? So all you have at that point is a concept step. That's what's in your packet. You're not approving that. A couple of hoops that they're going to have with this, for instance, is KDOT. Anything they want to do with access and driveways, KDOT's going to have a review, comment, and approval authority on it. So KDOT may say, you can't have four <coughs> access points, you can only have two. They may do that, okay, because they have access management on K32. So they've got to go through the K32 process in that sense. They will then also <coughs> have to go through our development plan review process at the preliminary and final step which then puts a lot more meat onto what is your concept. You really start doing your engineering studies, your traffic analysis, all of that work behind the scenes, stormwater analysis, 
all that now has to come to life. And essentially, you're making a commitment to what you're going to develop it. Landscape plans, science plans, all of that is part of it. Um, I will tell you, I've had a call in this process. I've had a call um, from an individual that wanted to put an ice vending. I don't want to call it a, it's not a cabinet. It's one of those machines that you go up to and, you know, it generates the block of ice and pay whatever it is. You know, there are a lot of people who use them when they go boating and stuff like that. And what I had to tell that person is to work with the landowner because if you want to do that, that needs to be part of that development plan so we understand circulation on the property and what's going on. Especially when you have truck traffic, automobile traffic, plus recreational traffic. Now do we even have the room for all those different maneuvers is that creative time. So they're going to have to go through a lot more hoops. Well, they've got the storage tanks and all kinds of things that have to be approved right by the KDH. Right. They'll have, right. For the fuel stuff and everything, they'll have to go through that. But generally, those are prefab tanks. You know, they're they're pretty much basically no money. Yeah, they're going to meet the permit requirements there. It's a matter of where are you citing those and how do they fit on the property. And the speed limit's 55 miles an hour. Is it 55 or 45? It's 55. Is it 55? Yeah. 55 East of there, there north of there, west of there, of the Jackson's at 55. That, that's a great concern for whatever big, long, slow trucks coming out of it. Um, that, and the way it's drawn, it's, the, re the grade is remaining low, so those trucks are pulling out on a pretty steep incline. The way that property is, yes, you're going to the highway, which would greatly impede their ability to, to, to ramp up. Um, I, I personally, my thoughts are I'd really like to see if they can put together a plan that makes sense. I'm a little concerned about a residence next door, the professional building down, the access of people heading west, accessing that uh, is, a, is of a concern. Um, I personally would rather see them go to KDOT because I, I really would not like making a change to it if KDOT's going to say no, no. no. Uh, so I, or, or the changes KDOT requires is going to be not agreeable for the developer, or for the owner. So I think there are a lot of hoops that, that really should be jumped through. The property owner is not here tonight. Oh, okay. So, Steve. Okay. Kevin, Sarah, I'm the uh, civil engineer that got hired for the end of development plan. I don't know if you, if you want to ask questions to that extent or not. I'm just stating my, my opinion for right. sure. but something that can be remedied. Uh, Would it trigger a traffic? I'm just, I'm just kidding. There'll have to be a traffic study done. KDOT will require it. Be done. It's been it's done. Zoning. It's been done. We, don't, we, just, we just completed it last week. That would, be re that would be required as part of the development plan process. It's not required for the rezoning application. I understand. Um, not wanting them to spend a lot of money if that's not the direction we're heading. Um, so, so I understand the catch-22 there if we're going to say, hey, we don't want to zone it that. Um, and my concerns are it doesn't really match the, the neighboring businesses. But then on top of that, down the road, when we're looking at eventually trying to make our downtown area more user-friendly, more recreational friendly. I just don't know if it fits in that picture. So um, honestly, I, I would hate for them to spend a lot of money and and go about getting the cladding done and the plans done um, if, if we wouldn't go with it anyway. But, and the rest of the council might feel differently, but I wouldn't want to do that and then that would tie up Potential uses and, and we want, what we might want that to be in the future. I just don't want to really fix. So. And if you want to go over, please, I think it would be helpful what their options are and what it takes as far as a vote. If, 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 how many have to vote yeah. for so, or against any yeah. of the So, obviously, one of your options is to support the recommendation of the Planning Commission could make a motion to essentially accept their recommendation and approve the rezoning to C3, which would take just a simple majority vote. Okay, so just four. Yeah, I'd take four out of you, out of your group. Okay. Um, the other option is you could choose to remand the item back to the Planning Commission, as Mr. Malott has indicated, 
Again, that is a simple majority of uh, vote to do that, um, but you want in your statement the reasons why you're sending it back and what you want the Planning Commission to look at as part of that process. Um, and we, I think I heard at least a few of those items. We just want to make sure we're reiterating it if that's the direction you want to go there. Um, then item three would be you could take action other than what the Planning Commission recommendation is. Um, and that would require a two-thirds majority vote of the governing body. So it includes the mayor, again, this is all governing body, um, but all of those options, two-thirds, again, is four out of the six. So you're still at four out of six. But those are basically the three options you have. The fourth and final option I believe is to make no motion and it dies on the lack of motion. Yeah, there would be, I think there's a shot, shot clock pause on that. I'd have to double check that real quick, Michael. I don't remember. I don't know what it is. And, and I wanted to ask something, too. So if there was a sunset clause on the if it did pass the rezoning passes, that it reverts back uh, in 12 months. Is that correct? Correct. So if there's a failure in that 12-month period to get a development plan approved and a plat approved for that property, it would then revert to the C2. It would not, if you would never publish the map with the C3 zone. So, so until, you, until you publish an ordinance, so a zoning is an ordinance, until that ordinance is officially published, it is not an effective ordinance, any type of ordinance, but specifically the claim. And we don't always have the reversionary clause because most of it, many times we have every. We have the zoning and the, and the planning all in one package. I mean, they, they take separate votes. But what we would do in this case, if, if it were to be approved with those stipulations, we won't publish that ordinance. So we we'll hold that ordinance until such time as the preliminary plan plat get approved, if that's the case, at which time then it would get approved and, and then the zoning technically would change. So, that, that's what we mean by conversionary is, is we've adopted the ordinance, but it, it takes two other pieces. It takes the signature of the mayor, and it takes, right, because you're authorizing the mayor to sign an ordinance, and it takes the, the publication of the ordinance in the official newspaper. So and the publication doesn't take place until the preliminary and final plans yeah, are exactly accepted by right. right. Well, it'd be you, it would be you. Right. right. It would come. The planning commission would give you a recommendation, and it would be your decision as to what to do. So just so we, just so you understand, it's it's a little convoluted. It's not our typical in that sense, but uh, that's that's how reversionary. Is. You can't rezone a piece of property technically, so you can't go rezone something and then go and change it back unless you go through a public hearing. And any time you zone a piece of property and you try to down zone that piece of property, so if something zone commercial, let's say you're trying to make it residential, and that wasn't what the owner wanted, that that you know, that is considered in most law as a taking. Because if you reduce the rights to the use of land, that's considered a, a taking. So that's why you seldom see cities, except when they do a broad rezoning, don't go rezone something and then the city turn around and rezone it to something less. Sometimes they'll re rezone it the other way, but, but typically that's why most of your property is left in an ag type of zoning district. But that's generally your your you know biggest properties, uh, somewhat in some respects more restrictive in the sense that in order to do anything other than ag work, you got to go rezone your property. So that's the truth. I understand. I just don't. I mean, I. I don't want to mislead and say, oh, let's do that and then have a, a revision if, like, my personal in intention and thought is that it might not fit there. And I, you know, I don't want to say, yeah, do it. And then they'll spend a bunch of money and then maybe vote differently later. So I just don't feel like. Um, and I, I think that's where I'm at also. Um, just struggling with does this fit with what we think that uh, should go right there on K32? We already know the challenges that we have there. And if we are looking at our comprehensive uh, plan that uh, we're, we're, you know, uh, walking traffic, bicycling, uh, whatever that may look like in the future, 
I don't know that um, putting in a, a truck stop is the is the right thing. Uh, if I had a if I had something in front of me that I could, you know, stick a fork in and cut it up, look at it, and see what it is, like maybe I could. You know, but uh, I don't. I think changing the zoning now and then opening it up to uh, some other things that could potentially come in there. I don't think that's the direction I'm interested in going. Just I, I, I'd like, I agree with both of you on that, but, and this is kind of challenging for me because I'm, I'm primarily a property rights guy. You own the property, you know, you've, you've got uh, you've, you've got the first law or first rights, and so, uh, but in the overall scheme of things, in the plan and that we have the the, the tri city plan that we have put together, uh, it's been a lot of money on and a lot of uh, planning in that and that corner being. With the, with the sign of crossings and the future development through there and so forth. It, it just, I'm like Commissioner K or, or Councilman K. Har, I really wouldn't want to give a false hope. But in a, that, and I want to be real careful about a couple of things. So one is understand the property, the two parcels right now are zone C2. So there are some commercial development sure. rates under the C2 that could still be pursued if you deny the C3. So there's still that piece there. Um, so I just want to make sure everybody's on the same page with that. The second part of that, when I hear you talk about kind of digging the fork, and that's kind of why you get that little bit of a concept plan. Because I think the concept, at least as far as I understand from the applicant in that, is still roughly what they're trying to do. There would have to be the landscaping added. There would have to be the conditions with KDOT that would have to be, but as far as the potential use of the property, the wanting to have the diesel fuel, things like that, you've got a rough idea of what they're proposing, and I think they're trying to stay within that concept. Um, what we're talking about is how many more details do we hang on to that? At what cost? If if there is if the if if there's a motion and, and, and adoption of denial, how long Period before they could come back for zoning. Well, they could not. They they could come back for rezoning, okay? Because the development plan is really the issue. If that was denied, they would not be able to come back with a new development or the same development plan for a year. They could come back with a different development plan in that period of time. There's nothing that precludes another request to rezone the property per se. It's really when you get into the development stage. Okay? But you'd have to have some real compelling reasons that you would change your mind later on to go to C3. If you're, if you're thinking that way, um, it's again, you have to have much more reasoning to sit there and say, I didn't accept C3, but now I'm six months down the road and I'm going to accept it now in the same location. I you still like have the ability to look at C3 in any location along K32, but what you're giving me guidance on, what you would be giving Michael and I guidance on tonight, is if you said, hey, C3 is just more intense in the uses that we want along here because of the K32 corridor and because of what the comp plan says and things like that, understand that what we're going to be telling people who come in with development applications along K32 is, if you go on after C3, it's not a very good likelihood that you're going to get C3. You will likely get C2, but it does give us policy guidance to allow us when we're talking with people to say, here's a recent decision. Um, so that's that's kind of what we're looking for here because the comp plan, you know, the comp plan's a general plan, so it's commercial. The K32 study is where you start getting into the walking trails, you start getting into some of the other stuff. And so what you would be doing tonight if you were to say we're, we're denying the C3 is what we're kind of saying is C2 may be the most intense commercial level that we want to see along K32 unless something really compelling came along. And, and while we're doing that, I just wanted to mention to, to, the, to the property owner, to the business owner, um, thank you for your interest in investing in our community. I, I don't take that lightly. I think all of us um, appreciate any, any business owner that's wanting to invest and, and put roots here, that's that's a really big deal and we do appreciate that. Maybe we can find a better location for them. Um, I just don't want them to spend extra money and, and be out of pocket more if it's, if it's not a good fit right there. That's, that's your call. <laughs> yeah.
I think I've done the best to advise you. It's really if there are no motions for anything, and I'm not hearing it. We would consider this thing uh, a temporarily stalled. <clears throat> but if you don't mind, and, and, and we can move on and, and if we need to come back to this, and if you want to hold this item over, you want to take, you know, I don't want to table this item to, 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 to a few people. I mean, I'm holding it over so Dave can go. We want to verify. I just want to check if, it, if there's no motion made. I want to make sure that we all know what we're getting into. Okay. Some codes have what they call it. Sometimes it says if there's no motion, then it, it may be yeah. that it passes. In okay. some places, so, it may be there's no motion, it doesn't pass. But, you know, you have a, you have a recommendation of approval. Yes. From the planning commission so we need to make sure we give you proper knowledge on that item dave can go search that so we can just hold this item i say a little lower okay. we won't take an action on it move on to the next item do we do we need a motion to table this item no i don't think we need <coughs> okay. to do anything i think we just i think we can just we'll, hold the we'll action just consider that it is time and go and and that's what i'll do the next <coughs> item. okay when you say come back later, that is that he, nine that, or yes. before, yeah. before we leave. Before we leave. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna delay this um, uh, this this item until further notice. Uh, before we get too much farther, I'm, Tom, I'm, I'm going to apologize that you understand that we've got all this stuff going on. But anyway, I would like to recognize our state senator and our commissioner at large, Tom Burroughs. Thank you for being here. My pleasure, Mayor. Would you like to make the presentation? Actually, after after the CARES item, after a few other agenda items, if that's all right, Mayor? Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. I'm going to catch you at the very end then. Okay, that be fine. to reports and, and comments from the council. Okay. <clears throat> Good evening, Mayor. Uh, you just got handed uh, an extra item here. We noticed... Uh, during that conversation that we inadvertently left out section 10.05 of our UPOC modifications which we've already discussed previously so there's no change in what was presented to you at the last meeting we just when we were cutting and pasting we just left that piece out and we do want to make sure that's part of uh, ordinance 1030 for tonight Again, uh, we've brought this item generally to you on two previous occasions. Uh, generally, we have spoken about this section 10.05, and we uh, spent some time uh, on section 10.29. 10.05 regards the unlawful discharge of a firearm. Uh, as you recall, we made basically two general adjustments. One is we define the term reckless, and two, uh, we added a section C that says uh, the section doesn't apply to the non-reckless discharge of a firearm on one's own property for the sole purpose of target practice by the owner or invited guest. So no change in that, and that's what we discussed. And while I know we didn't vote, that was generally the consensus. Uh, 10.29 is related to a violation of the public health order, which was an addition to the UPOC in 2020, and it was requested that be deleted in its entirety, which is included in the ordinance. So, what we spent some time on at the last meeting uh, had to do with uh, 10.06, uh, which uh, involves the discharge of air guns, air rifles, bows and arrows, slingshot, BB guns, or paintball guns. Now, first, and I know that the chief has reminded me of this several times, these are not firearms. Firearms are defined in the UPOC specifically, so these are not firearms. So if I use the word discharge or weapon, I mean that in a general way, not as a firearm. So don't confuse 10.05 when we're talking about firearms with 10.06, which involves these other firearms. 
as you recall, most of the discussion was around well, what is the shoot zone, where is the shoot zone, who should be in the shoot zone, who shouldn't be in the shoot zone. And quite honestly, after spending time looking at this, it somewhat made more sense to simply eliminate this whole discussion of shoot zones. So what you have before you does the following thing. The first section A is exactly as it is in the UPOC, which basically says you can discharge all of those things inside a building or other shelter that prevents the projectiles from leaving the building. Right? That's, that's what's the standard law. We then added a section that says, but that section doesn't apply except in your RS, RDS, which are basically neighborhoods that are on sewer, and R2 and R3. Now we have zoning maps and we can provide zoning maps, but we don't necessarily need to make them part of this code because we already have those. Uh, and we added the ability, if somebody came in and said, I want to set up targets because I teach kids in the Boy Scouts or some other thing, without putting a lot of detail in here, that a person will put together some process where a person could come in and ask for that request from the chief or his designee. Now I'll tell you, we've never had, in my 14 years, I don't think ever even an issue or a request or a discussion about this section of the code. Anyway. And then the last part of it was, and I don't know how we had an R ordinance, but we showed it as a Class B misdemeanor, when the UPOC, at least for the last few years, has it as a Class C misdemeanor. So, We've just corrected that. So the language in A and D is exactly as it is in the UPOC. It's the language that was in the UPOC in 2019. It's the language that's in the UPOC for 2020. And it was probably the language in the UPOC for many years. So what we're trying to do again is simplify. There, there's no need to have a shoot zone if you simply say you can use these things in the city, except for quite honestly, you're your most dense areas. We also took out anything about bow hunting, and the reason is, is if you can discharge a bow and arrow, and you have a hunting license, and you're on your property, you're already legal. And if you go into somebody else's, so, so some of the things was in there said you had to be in a shoot zone, we don't need a shoot zone. Number two, you had to be on your own property. And number three, you had to have the permission of the owner if you went on somebody else's property. Well, you pretty much have to have the permission of the owner if you go on somebody else's property because if they call and say, these people are trespassing on my property, the police are going to come and say, you can't trespass on my property. Right? They may have a hunting license, but you can't go on somebody else's property and, and go hunt without their permission. So what we've done is basically just strip that thing down to say, Let's get rid of all the excess. And again, Chief and I spoke a number of times. We can't even really tell you where all this originated from, to be quite honest. It originated before our time, so we've both been here 14 years relative to the city. So our recommendation is pretty much strip that part down to what proposed to you and uh, the other portions we've already discussed and reviewed. Uh, and if you would be uh, amenable to that, uh, I would just simply say that we would adopt ordinance 1030, including the language of 10.5, and we'll, we'll correct the, the published ordinance, uh, and it will include 10 point, the amendments of 10.5, the amendments of 10.6, the amendments of 10.13, and the amendments of 10.29. Um, I would like, and I'm sorry to be a pain in the butt about this, but I don't feel like any of us have had time to even look over 10.5 since we just got it this evening, and I'd rather any ordinance... Well, this was from the last meeting. We made no changes to it. Well, the, the discharge, um, the discharge, the firearm laws of discharge and lawful self-defense um, yeah. section shall not apply. We can't really amend B. That's state statute. So yeah. there's... Well, we did add... We added a C. C. Right. But, but that was done at the last meeting. This is nothing new that we didn't, this, what you're seeing here was mm -hmm. what was presented and discussed. So target practice, we had that verbiage at the last meeting? Yes. 
Yeah, we didn't do anything with it. I just I forgot to put it in the ordinance, but but the target practice out. Exactly. I remember discussing it. I'm sorry. Am I the only one that doesn't remember? Then, then why did we not vote on it last time? Because you wanted to vote about the shoot zones on ten point six. Yeah. And and I, I I had suggested go ahead and vote on everything. We could bring ten point six back, but the recommendation was let's just wait one more meeting and do it all. Yeah. So we have not any change to that from the last council meeting. Could you tell me what the definition of reckless is, since it's not actually on here? It says the term of reckless is defined in accordance with KSA twenty one dash five two o two as amended. It's not actually, I and I had it in the last agenda memo that I presented. I don't have it in front of me, but it is by state staff. I'm going to see if I can find it right now. Okay. Uh, I'll, yeah, and I was going to go grab my phone too. But so how, yeah. did, how did would this apply? Um, and you know, we had the one situation one a while back um, at down along the river, where uh, or 1005 or 1006, where we're just being able to sh hunt. Right down along the river. As long as it's not done recklessly, they're still good. To, that's still if they, yeah. if they have, if they're doing the if their firearm is discharged to lawfully take wildlife, which in other words they have a license and permit and, and they're, they're doing so, then then they then they would be permitted. Because there was never a shoot zone as it related to ten point five. Right. Shoot right. zone never applied. So there's effectively no place in the city that you couldn't hunt. There are places in the city that such action would be reckless. Yeah. You know, so, and, and of course, that's ultimately a determination of the court. Uh, did you find that there? It's it, it's kind of sprinkled throughout the, the language. Of, it doesn't say really where it's, it's broken out, at least according to 215202 that I found. But culpable yeah. mental state are classified according to relevant. Yeah, go to J. 52 J specifically. A person right. acts recklessly or is reckless when such person consciously disregards the <coughs> substantial and unjustifiable risk that circumstances exist or that a result will follow, and such disregard constitutes a gross deviation from the standard of care which a reasonable person would exercise in the situation. So we're not redefining reckless. Reckless is a state definition of a state statute. Law. Well, I'm okay with that. I would just yeah. prefer that the definition be right here because that was one of our issues before is we had someone who was target shooting right. in a safe manner and they were told, you're not allowed to do that here. And so... Well, I at the last meeting, we, when we discussed that, it was to put the term reckless in accordance with, and not put the full definition in there. So I, Why would we not do that? I mean, I other than you're repeating something that's already in the statute. If it's already there, you don't need to repeat it. Well, I mean, it, <clears throat> it wasn't easily. I, mean, I don't know. I, I personally, I think the, the, the most clear we can make this for our people, the better, instead of saying, okay, go dig through these statutes to find a definition. Um, I, I, maybe I'm the only one that feels this way. I just feel like the clearer we can make it, the less confusion we're going to have um, with people getting... I don't, I don't so. think you can guarantee they won't get confused. <laughs> I'm not sure it's much clear about it. I mean, it, because our conversations before even in the meeting were, okay, define reckless. Right. I mean, that's what you told us several times, okay, define right. reckless. Right. And so in here, it just says the un unlawful discharge is a reckless discharge or the uh, non-reckless discharge. So again, if you're, we're going to say, well, define reckless, that's why I said it might clarify it for a community if we could just add the definition. If you want the definition, I mean, that, that's y'all's call. I mean, again, when we last met, that, that would be... Michael, you can make that a hot link, too. If I, well, I'm just, yeah, I'm, to that point about putting the definition in the actual ordinance, does that open us up if that state language changes at any time, but our ordinance on our books does not change? That's my concern, and you could just put that as a hot link. And there could be that would drive you to the and and, and a lot of our a lot of our ordinances in the actual code it does have a like an annotated little footnote that will lead you to the direct, uh, direct statute and we could we could put that as front facing yeah, as we can yeah I mean, put a, a, a connection to that, that may, in the, that, that so it would highlight that, that, that. As long as it's easy 
easy to find. Yeah, it'd be if highlighted you are that. Looking through and it's not yeah. easy to find in. We didn't even have you pop on our page. And yeah, to, now, to, so. to to that point, as soon as this gets finalized, the intent is we'll have a, a dedicated page for the code of ordinances and the completed code of ordinances, and then a separate one related to the UPOC that pulls out and highlights the specific changes that we make right. as its own easily navigatable and findable page. Yeah, yeah, just for, for reference, when we talk about the Utah, we are only talking about offenses that are in the municipal court. So you could have charges, right, that, that still may talk about, I mean, there's, other, there's other statutes around weapons and, and guns and all, that would, would apply and even apply the term reckless, but they are not municipal. These are the only ones that can be filed within a municipal court. So, you, I mean, you can have filings in other courts that are other than misdemeanor. Technically, these things could get, because it's a state statute, so a state statute could get filed in the district court. In Wyandotte County, generally speaking, they will not take cases that have been put into UPOC to handle misdemeanor cases. I mean, they just generally don't handle most misdemeanor cases. I mean, if the sheriff's office does it, because that's the court, right? But I mean, municipal courts are around the locality and it's law enforcement. And so just so you know, it does, it, it's not just because we put something in here or don't put something in here that it automatically says the law changed at a state level. It's only dealing with what can be filed in the municipal court in the city of I totally understand, right. okay. um, but, but what I'm referencing is things that happened right here in the city with our, with right. our own people, and right. so in, in conversations before where we said, okay, to find reckless, but that was the confusion. We'll, we'll put a, so if we can put a link, yeah. so the way the code is set up, so in the code, if you go to our code of ordinances, and it, it says penalty is described in section, I think, 1.09.005. Right. We just have a standard penalty code, so we don't put in every section it's a class C and a fine is this. But you go back to that section and it basically says a violation of our municipal code is punishable by a fine of not more than $1,000 and or, or uh, in term in jail for 179 days or less or both, right? So, I mean, the judge has that, always has that authority as that. Most things should then set by some fee, fee ordinances or things like that. So I mean, they have you know traffic violations. There's a set point fee. There's a set if you're going 15 over. This is what what the fine is. Right? It, most things uh, it, are have a, some of them prescribed. So I, I would suggest we just add that as a, it would be a highlighted link of code. You click on it and it'll take you to the statutory reference. And it will, it can it take you right to J so you can get yes. right to the definition yeah. not have to do? I, I believe so. We'll have to give a publication, but I don't know why they can't. So. Okay. Oh, I think that would be right. very beneficial. And that way it would be current. They change yeah. the code, it would right. link to the current code. And I think what we've done, uh, I'm you know, bringing awareness to it and, and brain fly, I think is, is enlightening a lot of folks. I mean, even. Um, uh, the education at the police department level to let them know where we're at, where, where the councils went with this, uh, that it is not just across the board, no, you cannot go do, you can't target you. There are exceptions um, uh, for this to happen, and um, that it's not just a blanket, uh, no, you can't strike other than hunting. So I think I think doing what we've done is, is I think it's, what I set right. out to accomplish. So. Is, is it my understanding that map is no longer part right. of there's no shoot yeah. zone, no shoot zone. Okay. So the only thing you do map is no longer part of, right. the, of anything published or right. okay. And I think that definitely cleans and it up right. because it was so confusing. Right. I mean, when you say shoot zone to me originally, it meant, hey, this is where I can go shoot. Right. Mm -hmm. right? Go have that. So anyway, but I, one last thing, and I don't want to beat this thing to death, but so the person that is doing the archery training or teaching that, I right. mean, we know that that's been brought up. How did, how did they legally do it now? He is in the R1, so he is not. Okay, let's not, say they weren't in the R1. If they were in a residential development, yes. they were across the street. Yes. And they had, and 
if they want to shoot in their garage or whatever, they can do it. Sure. If, it's if, they, if right. they have some situation where they're doing Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, something, something, uh, teaching kids bow and arrows, right. they can come request an exception from the city through the police chief and, so, you know, and no charge. Well, we weren't planning on a charge, but I mean, okay. not, but I mean, but, but I mean, mainly, you know, we just want to ensure then what they're doing is safe and that there's, a, you yeah. know, are they doing it for five yeah. days? Yeah, you know, we don't want to set up a chain link fence. Yeah, we don't want to set up an arrow. Yeah, we don't want to set up a permanent archery range for every kid in the neighborhood to come shoot whenever they no, want but to. No, right? I guess what am I, I'm saying, there is a uh, um, mechanism in place that would allow under the right circumstances for somebody to be able to do that if it ever arose. Yes. That's all I'm going to for you. I make a motion to um, adopt um, Ordinance 1030 uh, for the 2020 Uniform uh, UPOC Uniform Public Offense Code. And, and with and yeah, with the uh, amendments mentioned. Okay. Who it second? Who is in second to, right. to adopt ordinance number 1030 with the 2020 Uniform Public Offense Code with the uh, amendments? Would the clerk please call roll? Kahar? Yes. Malak? Yes. Shriver? Yes. Stites? Yes. Adam? Yes. Thank you. Okay, next item on the agenda will be. Um, Consider resolution 2011 regarding city's acceptance of CARES Act money. Well, uh, as you know, uh, we have, were fortunate enough to receive $449,400 as part of the distribution of CARES Act dollars uh, in roughly the amount in Wyandotte County of $37.3 million. Uh, I brought to you, I believe, at our last meeting. Uh, a breakdown of the request which is attached uh, but prior to us being able to formally receive the dollars and I'm happy to say the county uh, received uh, its permission from the state I believe on Friday uh, I was on a call here uh, right before this meeting that they now have uh, authority to release the funds and so from the public entities they need a resolution that basically says yes we accept the funds we understand that there's the federal uh, a number of federal rules that we have to follow uh, and that we will do so um, and that we will provide the necessary reports to yes and i didn't i didn't see it uh listed on here but the numbers that you mentioned that your very first sentence i believe uh would you tell me what those were we're like? receiving 400 Four hundred forty-nine thousand four hundred dollars out of a total of thirty-seven point three million. Thirty-seven million dollars. We got less than forty-nine four hundred. And it was based on basically a hundred dollars per person. Is what it works out to a uh, hundred dollars per person. In total, the county and I, it was two hundred and I want to say around two hundred and. $70 per person, $78. I, I don't know exactly on top of my head. But, Say that uh, again. Say that again. The county, so, so the county gets the money, and then they sub out, we're a sub allocation. So the $37.3 million that the county received was based on population, the county's population, and plus $5 million because of unemployment and uh, poverty, I believe, are the other two, uh, uh, the other two aspects. And my question is, if you can that. remind me, what uh, what's the population of the county? 220? Uh, the county is about 165,000 plus. I, I don't remember the, the And that counts it? The county. And that counts it? The county as uh, the the well? Yes, that includes that. Right. But yet it was a hundred dollars a person. Yes. So that's how, how does that come up to thirty-seven million dollars? Well, not all of the monies went to cities. So uh, a portion, uh, I believe, uh, seventy-five dollars per person went to the county health department. Uh, 
and I'm trying to go $9. $9, I believe, went to the county, as the county, and the remainder went to 501c3 and other nonprofit organizations. Okay, so we received $224 per person. That's right. Uh, that's right. The, 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 the county did. The county did. Right. And we're receiving a hundred dollars per person. And the county received how much of that? Are we, did you well, say nine dollars worth that? Well, so the the unified government, right? So city and county. Yeah. So the city portion also received a hundred dollars per person, and they have, and, and I'm roughing numbers. They have about one hundred and fifty-two thousand that live in the city, and then you've got Bonner, and then you've got us to make up make up the rest. Of it. And so the three cities all receive the same proportional share by population, hundred dollars per person based on population. The county received a nine dollar allocation for county related expenditures. Now I, I will tell you that the cities, the, the two cities here, uh, us and Bonner Springs. We're, we're not in favor of that allocation. We felt like we had three governing bodies, that each of the three governing bodies could receive the same amount of money, and then those governing bodies could make an allocation however they felt was appropriate for their community. Right. Uh, so that was the discussion, but ultimately uh, it was approved. And that system. was a panel of how many? 11, 10? Uh, I think there was nine or ten. There was three, three commissioners. Uh, so myself, nine, like, nine or ten? Or, or nine. Or I, ten. I, don't, I don't recall if it was nine okay. or ten, but three commissioners. I, three so commissioners. Uh, you had a representative from the public health department. Uh, you had an assistant county administrator. Uh, you had the director, chief financial officer. Uh, one from Bonner Springs, one from Edwardsville. I believe that's who was on the committee that were voting members of the committee. There were other people that were involved for support. Uh, that, that so other voted. than the two that were representing Bonner and Edwardsville, I mean, the interest of the remaining seven or so, or eight, were at the city level, KCK or UG. But they were they were members of the unified Yes. But just Disproportionately for, represented. And just for numbers' sake, at nine dollars is one point four eight five million. Yes. And so, what portion of that comes to us, which is part of the county? I don't have an answer. Or is this the usual answer, where we don't know, but you get something? Where we don't get anything. Well, yeah, which like, is like like the services that yeah. we, we asked. Yeah. Mike, is this is that nine dollars? Is that what funded the health department? Or is no, that the health department received a separate funding? Fund. So, is it would not be the only county services we really received? You know, I, I mean, you, you have district courts, you have the sheriff's office. I mean, you, it's, it's, it's irrelevant. I, I'm just sure, I I'm not here to defend it one way or the other. Uh, and then there was a, a portion that was allocated for the administrative portion. I, I, I think it was $4.54. Four Mike, four do you happen to know, did we get anything in addition for our police and fire department, or is that to be included in our city money at the $100 per person? It's, it's included in our money. And was Kansas City, Kansas the same? Yes. Because I, when I saw the breakdown, it looked like the KCK Fire Department had over 900 thousand allocated to them and then the KCK Police Department had over forty thousand allocated. Well the, the, the unified so the unified government, the way that they processed it, they had each individual department uh, make some middles. So and some departments might have had a submittal together. So police park can make a submittal, fire park can make a submittal, public works, parks, whoever made those requests and so they everybody submitted their submittals and internally inside the UG they whittled those down uh, and then ultimately because quite honestly it wasn't very clear from the beginning and I'm not going to put that on the UG that, that the information we continue to get from the state 
over, I mean, again, this all occurred within 50, 60 days from the time Spark said, here's this much money that the county can have to, we have to have an answer. I think it was 56 days without much guidance, you know. I, I understand what you're saying, but I kind of will put it back on the UG in right. this sense. They were able to get their own police department and their own fire department the information to get their bids in. If they gave us that same courtesy, our police and fire could have had extra funding from the CARES Act. And when you're looking at, I, do you happen to know what their Parks and Rec Department got? I do not. For a two county parks that they maintained but then Kansas City, Kansas Parks. When I look at 449,000 and I have so many zeros, I mean, a, a learning lab when we're shutting down businesses, expecting people to work from home, um, shutting down schools to 50% capacity, expecting our students to work from home, and a huge majority, a huge amount of our population has very little internet, very poor quality internet at best that they're supposed to be running multiple Chromebooks or multiple iPads off of at the same time. So they're shutting us down, but then we're getting 0% while their parks and rec are getting trail upgrades and new vehicles. I just, I mean, you know how I feel about it, but I think it's a good time to reiterate when we're looking at this funding. They're to look after us as well. They're to care for us as well as the county. And they could have easily said, hey, just so you know, our police and fire putting in bids would be a good opportunity ever to your police and fire put in extra bids and Piper School Districts putting in all of this for our um, Chromebooks and technology and computers to go home with our teachers and students. Hey, Bonner School District, it'd be a great idea for you guys to go ahead and bump this up so it could be more equitable across the board, where I feel like we're just shoved under the rug again and again. Well, and I think it's a, interesting to point out that the police department did make some recommendations and um, the PD lobby was the, that amount of money, the 40 grand was just taken out. Um, uh, PD booking room, I mean, things that directly um, affect your personal contact related to someone that could potentially have COVID, um, that they, I mean, not that I'm taking away from the learning lab or, or anything, because those Absolutely. are equally as important, but when you have a request from a police department to that, that is putting their hands on folks and directly coming in contact, and 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 it's just taken out. I, well, right. and, well, and then you see, and then you see what uh, Casey Case Police Department was right. able to put in for and receive. It's just, I mean, well, I, and I will say this. Work. So, so relative, so note the committee, again, which I was on, did not vote on each funding. Group. No. They right. also, that was originally what they did, and, and, and so if we go back to the, to the original amount, $224 uh, per person, for us that would have equated to slightly over a million dollars, I don't remember exactly. And as you can see, we submitted what we felt were applications relatively close to that. And, and I do think that there's some there's some administrative work that, quite honestly, the county does have to do. It's doing a lot of stuff, and, there, and there's costs associated with that. So I, I wasn't too worried about that. But uh, there was discussion about why don't at least the two smaller communities get the full 224, mm -hmm. and then the rest of it goes to, to, to the UG, and you decide on the, which would have been $3 million. I mean, roughly, we would have been a million, I think, uh, Bonner Springs would have been a little under two million just by population. I'm trying to do it. But you were two votes. Huh. Right. And so and there was no one else that saw it your way. Yeah, and then, so that would have left thirty four million, roughly thirty four million dollars for however the county wanted to allocate it for all other purposes. Now I would say we didn't have any not for profit entities uh, from our area that that submitted. Uh, as you know, the school submitted what the school submitted, uh, uh, you know, much less than what the pipe district did, and I think some of the others. Uh, Which so. is why I don't understand why they couldn't say, okay, and because, because I, I reached out to the commissioner and they said, well, it was a percentage. Well, 
but when the when the amount when the total amount when you look at our pop our enrollment K through twelve enrollment to Piper's K through twelve enrollment and they're very similar. And then so when you're looking at one asking for hundreds of thousands more than the other and say we're just going to do both eighty percent, that doesn't make sense. Right. It just doesn't make right. sense. Well, you can say let's fund this one. And then we'll we'll tear this one down a bit. If we were both asking for the same amount, and you decided that you were going to give eighty percent to each, that's sure. that's okay. But or when one has, one is asking for ten million, and one's asking for one million, and you decide you're going to ask for eighty percent, well, that's you keep using the term unified government, unified government, unified government. That tells our students in this portion of the unified government that you are worth much less than the students in the other portion of the unified government, which is hogwash. If you're going to do this on an equal basis, every student in this county under the United, or unified government should receive the exact same amount. That is the only equitable way to do this. And for us to be shunned this much, and for it to be so weighted, I, I'm not getting used to it. I'm getting more irritated every single time it comes up. It's like we don't have any representation at Seventh and Ann at these meetings. So what are we supposed to tell our citizens? What do we tell our students who have friends in Piper? Oh, well, you're not as important as the students in Piper. Sell that one. Mike. Yes, me. Is there, I mean, I realize we probably have to, is it, we have to accept it to receive money. Yes. There's, is there any discussion left? Is there any pushing back? Is there any, um, is the county interested in, in our needs, in our needs in the community or the CARES Act funding? Or have they made their decision and it really doesn't matter at this point? I'm not sure I can answer that question, to be honest with you. I mean, uh, maybe uh, the commission is there the money or you don't accept the money. I, I mean, I, I, I mean the know. money has all been allocated. Right. So, so the next so the process was so that we worked as a committee, we yeah. tried to come up with some semblance of dollars. That was then put into a plan that got submitted to what's called the SPARC Committee, which is the funding from the state. The state reviewed all the counties, the 105 counties submitted plans. And they reviewed those plans and either said, we accept or reject your plan. The plan for Wyandotte County has been accepted with three exceptions, and I don't know what those are, but other than they were unified government department uh, submissions that, that they have that well, they push back on, on so it doesn't impact ours. A huge regarding. chunk of it is going to non for profit. Um, About nine million dollars is going nine for, million. So we, we can profit. get one million to run our city. And, and granted, a hundred dollars per person um, per city. We've got a fire department to run. We've got a police department to run. We have a court to run. We have a city hall to run. Those cost so much. It, it not so much per population. Like those just right. cost so much. To um, but when you're looking at the non-for-profits getting how many million? Nine, approximately nine, nine million. million. So we're getting a tenth of that. Um, I called harvesters. I don't. I uh, and like I, I know that you guys said, hey, would this be okay to see if we could have them come into our own the Edwardsville to have them do one of the drive-through grocery giveaways, like they've done in KCK, over and over and over again. And it's great for that community. That's fine. Didn't even get a call back. So it, it would be nice if some of the non-for-profits if i just feel like i mean i guess we have to if there's no adjusting it at this point we'll have to vote to accept it i just i, I would say i, I, I would say at this like point our, our 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 option is to accept or reject right. this amount of money is there opening or opportunities for other discussions uh, if, if, if any of the funds that are being allocated to the G, and I can't tell you honestly all their, I, I know there's stuff in the paper, but how they've sub-allocated, made decisions, and, and there could be revisions to that. You know, you know, we took the approach we took when we did it was we said, what are our, what were the costs that we knew we had 
direct cost. I think this was the way that the bill, the legislation was written. What were your direct costs, right? Cost for PPEs, for people where we had to bring in overtime people because you have a person that's out uh, because of the illness or you had to do extra stuff for the courts to do re remote, you know, our remote costs, any of those things to ensure our people all got paid fully during that time. So we said, don't come in because we got to separate people and you can work four hours and you can work four hours and make them all whole, right? That, that was priority number one and that was supposed to be the priority overall was what are those direct costs that you should be reimbursed for? Right, and so right. that Which was, was like that's the, the 160, almost 164,000. Right. Then we took the remaining part and said, okay, we want to focus on projects that help make sure that our citizens can connect with and interact with its elected officials and the staff members that provide service and the other one was to ensure the safety of our people, right? The, the modification of the police department, uh, the sterilization equipment for the fire department, which also gets used through all of our building. You know, that, that's why we focused on those items specifically. How do we get, and, and that's where internet comes in. That's where being able to have video conferencing comes in, right? And so that's how we focused it. Uh, you, you know, others, took a bit of a different approach. Well, uh, it's almost uh, like there needed to be a spreadsheet that a checklist, hey, this is what you should focus on. Okay. Not just, hey, go forth and conquer and hopefully you come up with a, something that uh, we're willing to uh, check and say that you're blessed and you get that m amount of money. Um, it, it probably would have been helpful. I mean, and I was on that committee. They were asking yeah. for, we could have asked for the same thing. Right. I mean, when, we're at, when it's a $9 million for nonprofits, and we asked for less than a million dollars to for a city. We asked for nine hundred twenty-six thousand, and we're not, and we're, and we're cut. That number is then cut in half. It, in, and I understand what you're saying about the the actual COVID costs, but then I don't understand zero percent for PD lobby modifications. Right. I don't understand um, not improving our our broadband so that we can send that out, and and I don't understand why there would be things like park and recreation trails that are probably not just going to the Wyandotte County Parks, because I've asked about that, um, when our city can't even get 926,000. But wow. we're going to redo parks, trails, but not at the end of But not at Versville Park. I but not at Park. Yeah. Now, I just want to be clear. So the, the reductions here were made in terms. Right, so you can, you can I mean, Okay. Because we only had four hundred forty-nine thousand four hundred dollars. Well, you had to cut it somewhere. I mean, so so I I, I mean, and, and you know, in each of the departments, we talked about what what's the most important aspect, right? So relative to the police department, you know, the the I, booking the room model. Okay. I mean, our police I department asked for one hundred and forty thousand dollars. Right. Uh, yeah, I, I, just, I just want to be clear that at the end of the day, I had to make the decision, right, to say I only have $449,400 and I don't have 926000 so where are we going to make adjustments and have the, the biggest impact? And collectively, that's what we did. But all I don't think Jenny might just complain about that. Oh, right. We're complaining about a ridiculous comparison. And that you were put in a situation to say, how do I make our entire city a whole for being shut down by the county and, and mandates across our police, fire, court, school, or community? How do I make, for, for you to be put in that position, you say, how do I make us whole on $439,000 when there was how, how many million? 37. 37 million. 37 million. It, it just it speaks for itself. I, I just think there needs to be a change in thought at, at 7th and Ann is we are all residents of Wyandotte County. No one is more important than the other. And if there's this type of a crisis, this, is a, this supposedly was a phenomenal big crisis and we had to act now. Every department was mandated to do certain things and then we get this type of treatment, with, when we have as high a quality of citizens and employees as any other part of this county, 
and we and we get this kind of allocation. It's it's shameful. It's absolutely shameful that the, that the whole thought process of seventh and Ann is so weighted towards that end of the county. It's just shameful. That type of thought process is ridiculously shameful. Well, and it's been and it's been expressed. Uh, I mean, over and over and over and over, we've seen that. I mean, when it comes back, when it goes back to uh, the, just the most recent was not even including us in deciding on where we were going to have COVID testing. We make the recommendation because we have our city where we know that the, that makes the most sense to have that test site, and then we are not even brought, not even advised of that. Oh, by the way, we find out that there was a test done down in the industrial park that we weren't even brought up to speed on. I mean, the, the, there, that lack of communication with us is not there. Or I mean, it is there. There is no. We are. We're not working together. It's not a two-way street for sure. Um, and and it's, it does get frustrating. Um, now, I will say that on that nine or ten board panel, um, that my understanding, and I, and I may be wrong, but the, the, some of the, the commissioners that were uh, put on that board, um, others that may have wanted to be on that board, they weren't asked. If they, the, the ones that were on there were uh, delegated, you're going to be on this committee. So, which, whoever did that delegating of people that's going to be on that committee, I think, personally, I believe, uh, should have looked and said, we really should have a representative from the Bonner or Edwardsville. Either it be the at-large um, or, or uh, the, the assigned, District 7. Um, I, I think that should have been the my, but then it kind that kind of goes back to what we are saying about it kind of that stepchild to the side that doesn't really you know um, and I guess stepchild probably not a political correct thing to say anymore but I mean so what I mean is man eh, 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 it's just Bonner it's just Edwardsville well. um, so it's frustrating I'm very very frustrated. Um, with the outcome of these dollars. And I know that we only had two two people. I mean, originally we weren't even put on the board, if you remember, which I know we all do. We weren't even asked to be on the board. So. Well, there were two people that were claimed to be Edwardsville, but they actually were Bonner Springs. So. Not on a different. On, on, a, yes. on a different, yes. Right. yes. Right. So that was, that was our representation. So, Hopefully, uh, there, uh, we all know that there is room for improvement. We can only look up because I don't know that we could really reach, go much further down. I mean, and that that, uh, that um, communication gets fixed and that we um, are, are taken more serious with our needs and what we need at, uh, at our level. I think for us to ask for $140,000 for our police department and then to find out that there's nine million dollars assigned to nonprofits, and we couldn't get the hundred forty thousand for them, I think that's that's, that's terrible. That's not that's not looking out for our city. It's not looking out for a county residence. If you think of if they're looking at the county as a whole. It's not equitable treatment of all of the citizens of the county or the unified government. It's just pure and simple. That, that's what, if you want to look at it that way, that's the best way to look at it, is how unequitable it's, it is on a per person basis in the county. What would be interesting too is to see when you look at the breakdown of the non for profits, all the businesses, all the money, and where those serve primarily. That, I think that would be really interesting to see where the money is going um, for the organizations, for the, I mean, you know, some, some of us count, but the, of the 30 some million dollars, I have a hard time believing that much more than 449,400 will uh, benefit our, our people in Everest. Um. 
So I'm guessing you need a resolution <laughs> to a uh, motion to uh, motion. Uh, approve resolution. Um, Mr. Mayor, I'll make a motion to adopt resolution number 2020-11. Resolution of the City of Edward Hill related to the city's acceptance of coronavirus relief funding. Second. It has been moved and seconded to adopt resolution 2020-11. Would the clerk please call the roll? Kahar? Yes. Malak? Yes. Shriver? Yes. Stites? Yes. Adam? Yes. We intend to spend the money quickly. Before they take it back. We have to, yeah. <laughs> we, we have been preparing <laughs> the assumption. I got checks ready to be signed. I, um, Mike, I, I would like to go back to Dave, so Dave say. doesn't have to sit here any longer. I, I, I will. I will just say for us now, we do have an item coming up of where I think our uh, fire chief has been working diligently with kids in Kansas Fire Department in, in a positive way. So yeah. I will. I will leave it okay. to him to discuss that part. Dave, you're you're next after Dave, chief. Bouncing back to Sorry. item number seven. Sorry, I just wanted to confirm something with the city manager. Um, so we're bouncing back to the rezoning request for 10625 10635 Pod Drive. I did take a look in the uh, zoning regulations themselves. And zoning regulations, there is no shot clock involved here. So, but what the zoning regulations do say is that when the planning commission in its report submits a recommendation of approval or disapproval of the proposed zoning amendment, the city council shall review the proposed amendment and adopt the recommendation, override the recommendation, or return it to the commission as provided in Kansas State Statutes 12757. So I went ahead into the state statutes, looked at the section that appeared to be applicable um, and this is the guidance we use for your three options on the motion, but there's an interesting thing here. Nowhere does it appear to address if you took no action. Okay? There's not any indication of that. But the preface that it does say is that the governing body may do some of these things. So it's not a you shall do the three options, which is approve, deny, or send back. It says may. Now that's... I'm not a legal advisor, so I can't really tell you what that means, but I just wanted to make sure that was up in the open. I will tell you also, in this period of time, um, in looking at this, I've had a discussion with the applicant's rep who is sitting here with us. We have a meeting scheduled for Wednesday, it was scheduled anyway, um, with the applicant in this, and what I'm gonna suggest that we do is table this item until two weeks from now to their next meeting that's going to allow us to meet with the owner's rep and the owner. We're going to describe the situation to them. There is a potential that they may choose to just withdraw the application completely and try to formulate a plan around the C2 zone. I can't commit to that tonight. The owner's rep cannot commit to that tonight. But by tabling, it at least gives the option that if we have the meeting, we explain the scenario and where we're going, we may be able to have a situation where we get a development proposal that goes to C2. Now, what's nice about that is if they if they voluntarily withdraw the application at this point, then everything we talk about, any shot clock, anything that's involved there, is off the table because there was never action taken on the item. So this gives them that opportunity to do that. Um, and we may, we may find that they stay within the C2 zoning and their plan is different than what they're thinking about in C3. But, but I have a question about the, uh, you said something about a, a KDOT study, like KDOT would have to do a study to find out what so the what, fact would be, whether well, it was negative. What would happen is, and they indicated tonight that they've done traffic analysis. That traffic analysis would be the study that KDOT would evaluate. Okay, so they've already done some work okay, back when behind. When you say analysis, does that mean like G cell lanes that could are not, be. That are not yeah. there? Could be. There's not any room for them because the canopies for the station are 
almost 100 items. Right. This, that would all be KDOT dependent on reviewing the analysis and what it's telling them and what Based they would do. ingress, egress, the right. safety of it, the right. speed limit that's on the highway right. as it is right now, right. the condition of the highway as right. it is now when you enter and exit that station the way it is, right. the, metal, the fellows that stand there like they do down on 98th Street, the KDOT doesn't do anything about it. So. That's my two cents on that. Yeah, all like of that K dot would review. I would like to make sure that they're aware of that if we do decide to table this until it's mm -hmm. needed. I don't see any issue with tabling it. I, I, would, two, I would recommend tabling it. That would sure alleviate a lot of unknowns. Right. Do you need a motion to table? I don't see any issue with table one for two weeks, and if we gather more information between now and then, I think that that only helps us make our decision. Um, I make a motion to table item number seven, which is uh, to consider the recommendation for approval from the Planning Commission regarding an application to rezone property 10625 and 10635 Paul Drive. There has been a motion and a second to table item number seven. Would the clerk please call the roll? Kahar? Yes. Malak? Yes. Schreiber? Yes. Stipe? Yes. Adam? Yes. Good Thanks, night. Dave, for doing that. No problem. Yeah. And what I will tell you is if the applicant chooses to withdraw, what will happen two weeks from now, the item may still appear there, but there will be a basic report that says this item has been withdrawn by the applicant. So that way you'll at least get that report and nothing else. Thank okay. you. Thank, thank you very much. Yep. Next item on the agenda we'll consider authorizing entry into a mutual aid room with the city of Kansas City, Kansas for fire and emergency medical response services. Chief Whitam, you're on the floor. Mayor, ladies and gentlemen of the council, for you tonight is the recommendation of the staff to sign into a mutual aid agreement between the City of Edwardsville Fire and EMS Agency and the Advocate of Kansas City, Kansas Fire and EMS Agency. Now, this is the background. For many years, there's never signed a mutual agreement between the two agencies. We could just call as needed. Um, through the course of some leadership change in uh, the Kansas City, Kansas Fire Department, we have formalized more of a mutual aid agreement that identifies what we were going to call, who was going to answer to who. We retain control of the city's teams besides the city. They were still our employees retain uh, our control and our oversight. We need to be going to Kansas City, Kansas. There still are employees, even though they may be working for Kansas City, Kansas, upon a couple of incidents, especially mutual aid. It's all in the accordance to, or it's all within the state statutes that are signed by the KSA. Uh, it was reviewed prior to legal counsel uh, before. Uh, there's no financial impact to it at all. It's just a formal document that says if we are exceeding our resources and we have exceeded our capabilities that we can call on mutual aid for Kansas City, Kansas, if they have those resources available, uh, they can respond to us and vice versa. It does not mean that we have to sit there and drop something. If they call for us, we cannot support it in the same way. Uh, either party can terminate within 90 days by KSA with notification. It's just requesting for myself, the city manager, to sign this agreement to pass it along to the city. Who was uh, the driving force behind this? Between myself and Chief Callahan, both those uh, probably pretty equal to it. Um, there, like I said, when I first got here, there was no mutual agreement signed between uh, the city of Eversville and Kansas City, Kansas. Um, many times we were we presented it and just told, just call, we'll be there. Uh, that has not been a recommended practice for 15 years, uh, since uh, for 19 years, most definitely since post 9-11. Um, issues. So after there was some leadership change, downtown was reapproached. Uh, it's taken some time with uh, some other issues to get worked out along the way. Uh, we were comfortable with it. Do we have this same agreement in place with Bonner? Uh, we have to go back and double check. We do have a mutual agreement with Bonner signed beforehand, yes. Does Bonner have a mutual agreement with KCK? Uh, right now that I'm aware of, no. Are they working on that, maybe? Yes, there was a proposal on their side. Um, their city manager had proposed a three-way agreement between all three communities of Wyandotte County. Uh, myself and Mr. Webb were both of the buildings uh, that we should sit there and sign between the two parties ourselves so that we're not affecting a three-way agreement when one of the two of us may sit there and sell. Okay. 
That just makes more sense to me. We're sending resources out to Bonner where we're limited, KCK. It just makes more sense. Wasting I, our truck miles and... I will say that, 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 that you know, this has been an ongoing discussion for a long time. Uh, I will say that with some leadership changes at KCK Fire Department, Chief Callahan, I think it's been a more open, receptive discussion. I haven't personally been involved in those. I can say that in my previous discussions, and I believe Chief Whitten was with me at the very first meeting we ever had uh, down there with, with Mr. Bach and the then Fire Chief. Uh, I don't know that we, and I would say more on the fire, it wasn't a very uh, receptive uh, situation. As a matter of fact, it was even issues of where they wouldn't respond to medical emergencies unless we have mass a mass casualty incident. I, I think their yeah, response was more hostile than anything. Uh, That's my opinion. But I, I, I think our working relationship, uh, I mean, there's always little things that pop up. I mean, that's just, that's true. And, and I don't but know I what's driving to... or what has driven that animosity, I guess, type. I don't know why. I mean, to, to, to say that I mean, there must have been some reasons, and I don't know what they are, and I don't pretend to know those reasons. Um, but, I mean, it, I guess it kind of goes back to, all the way back to the point we're talking about the CARES Act all. That kind of resentment, like, you're not there to help you all, or... Uh, well, it's frustrating. Yeah, I, 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 I really, when, when I really <coughs> break down the true meaning of unified government, I mean, it, it to me, it feels like, I mean, it, it means that we are together and we're, we're here to help each other figure out how to get through whatever may be presented to us. Not, well, we're, you guys are under our thumb and um, we're going to make those decisions and hope it's okay for it works out for you all. And I think that, I think that was somewhat the position, right? If you call for help, I mean, number one, you'll have to call for help. I mean, I, I don't know how many times I've told that you can't do this and you can't do that. And then number two, if you call for help, we'll decide what we're going to send you. You know, we we have an accident on K32. I got a police department, I got a fire department, I got ambulances, but we need an extra ambulance, or we need another, you know, we need another pumper for traffic control. And what we got was a full battalion response, and then and then was told. Will you use up all our resources? And we're going, quit sending. I mean, we're not asking you to send us two pumpers, an air of truck, two ambulances, and, and four other people. I mean, I think our fire department is fully capable of assessing the scene and deciding what resource. This, and, and I'll say, I think Chief Callahan understands that, and I'm on the outside. But what this does is it specifically says that. It, you know, if they need something, you know, they need another aerial truck, and we're and we're available, and, and, and you know whatever it is, we're not going to send the whole fire department. Or they need another ambulance because it's an accident at I-70, or it's on well I-70, or it's on 435 north of I-70. We're in an area we can respond. I, I think they have done a great job of working that out, and I, I think a lot of that has has is going away. It's gone away, or like you said earlier. There's room for improvement. I think this, on the fire side, is certainly a good first step for it. And more than likely, right, I mean, they have far more resources than we have. I don't think there's ever been a question about that, right? But, but there's times when we provide them service, too, so. When I read through the agreement, I, I, it was actually a joy to me. Because this is how government should work. This is how two four portions of a county of a unified government should work together, recognizing that every person they're serving is of equal value. Every life in every part of this county is just as valuable as any other life in any other part of the county. I, I, this is a beautiful document. I make a recommendation that we uh, accept the fire and emergency medical response Services mutual agreement. Second. You make a motion, not a recommendation. No, no <laughs> motion. Okay, motion. Yeah. Is there a uh, 
such a document within the police department? They have a little different statutory. Because I've never yeah. seen that at my time at the police department, yeah. that there was this angst or, uh, um, you know, I mean, I remember back, and I don't want to date myself, but back when 104th and uh, K32, the gas station was the spot to hang out in Edwardsville, a policeman and everybody, the sheriff's department and everybody. But I, but and it just seemed like it was the more of the fire department and, but never within the police department. So, uh, I mean, it always seemed like we were, I mean, we were willing and they were willing and everybody was willing to on the police side work together. Part part of that was the leadership that was downtown within the specific fire department. Mr. Webb talked about the first meeting. His recollection of the first meeting reminds two different things because there was no meeting. We were just given and told what we were going to get. Um, when I called for mutual aid at the fire at Office Max, I got 13 pieces of apparatus because somebody kept dispatching this stuff out here. The last fire we had on June on 110th and uh, on 110th Street, we requested initially from KCK a pumper after the response with us at Bonner Springs. We got a pumper. We requested an additional pumper and an additional ambulance, and we got exactly what we requested. We would have never got that prior to reworking the new leadership that we have. Okay. So it is, it is a new day that is just taking some time to get there. That's good. I do think that there, so in the law enforcement side, there are some different statutory uh, protections as it goes. One of the other benefits of a mutual aid agreement has really, it, it, it's as much a a legal thing about uh, a person's injured and workers' comp or whose liability. If, if your fire truck's responding to a call and is in an accident, so part of what this does too cleans it up. Basically says, right, if, if, if our people respond to a call with PCK and they're injured on the job, they're covered under our workers' comp and vice versa. If there's an accident, it's you know it doesn't matter where the accident occurred. The liable party is the party that's operating the piece of equipment, which is the way it is and should be. But it provides, I, I can tell you, I've seen a situation where actually a firefighter was killed in the line of duty in another city without an agreement, and he was a volunteer in one city and worked in another. And the problem came about they had no mutual aid agreement, so was he killed in the line of duty as it related to his first employer? And they said no, because he wasn't working for the fire department at the time, he was a volunteer in another department which they didn't cover insurance and it ended up being in a big mess. So these kind of agreements also, from just an administrative standpoint, help protect our city and our people in those scenarios. So I know you have a motion on the same. If there are no other comments, I'm going to call for the um, clerk to, to for roll call. There is a motion and a second. Okay, Hart. Yes. Malott? Yes. Shriver? Yes. Stites? Yes. Adams? Yes. Thank you. Uh, next item on the agenda will be consider selecting Gordon CPA to serve as the city's auditor for the year ending December the 31st, 2020. Sean, you're on board. Good evening, Mayor, members of the council. Um, Gordon CPA was selected as the audit firm for um, the 2019 fiscal audit. Um, during the course of the audit, there was no issues with management between Gordon CPA and the city management. And um, city staff recommends selecting Gordon CPA to serve as the city auditors for the year ending December 31st, 2020. Um, the total cost for the upcoming 2020 audit is not expected to exceed $10,875. Um, total cost for the fiscal year 19, 2019 audit was $13,600. And the major difference there is because the city received over $1.1 million in um, federal funding and therefore a single audit report was required because it went over the $750,000 threshold. Motion to select Gordon CPA to serve as the city's auditor for the year ending December 31st, 2020. Second. 
does that amount uh, of uh, 10875 need to be included in the motion? It, it can't be. I mean, it's contractually it's stipulated. Contractual amount, yeah. Yeah. So not to exceed $10,875? Second. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, there is a motion and a second to select a Gordon CPA to serve as the city's auditor for the year ending December 31st, 2020. Would the court please call roll? K.R.? Yes. Lott? Yes. Shriver? Yes. Stites? Yes. Adam? Yes. Great Thank presentation. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> he's got one more to do. Uh, okay, he's got another one. Okay, the next item is consider resolution 2012 regarding the gap waiver for the 2020 audit. <laughs> uh, you know what? We can we can save you. I make a motion to uh, uh, adopt uh, resolution 2020-12 regarding the gap waiver for the audit 2020 audit. Second. Moved and second to adopt the resolution 2020-12 regarding the gap waiver for the 2020 audit. Would the clerk please call roll? K. Hart. Yes. Lott. Yes. Shriver. Yes. Stites. Yes. Hey, not that we don't love hearing your presentation, yeah. but yes. But, but I'm yes. sorry you got to, wasn't allowed for you to do it, but that's you okay. Pray for you. <laughs> okay, um, Representative or Commissioner Burroughs, would you like to make some comments? <laughs> <laughs> Do you want me to limit you to three minutes? <laughs> <laughs> I may want to limit you to three minutes, Mayor. <laughs> but Mayor, uh, City Council members, thank you for having me this evening. Basically, I came out, I, I caught the agenda. I wanted to, this is one of the few Monday nights I have available to come out and listen to <coughs> the concerns of this, uh, this city. I know I catch uh, Bonner and you both have the meetings on the same evenings, and it's very difficult for me to make each meeting plus the meetings and sub-meetings I have at the Unified Government. Nonetheless, I still want to come by, and I do stay up on uh, the website and see what's coming up. Uh, I'm going to step my toe into the CARE funding. I, I know there's a lot of concerns, and I, I hear the angst. First and foremost, you have every right in the world to feel the way you do. You're absolutely justified in that. I will share with you that initially, as chair of the Finance Committee for the Unified Government, I was a little miffed as to why I wasn't appointed to serve in that chair's capacity. Uh, but whatever it is, the mayor made those appointments, and I just really kind of surprised there was no Southside Commissioner appointed whatsoever to that committee. And uh, I made my, my point known. I also made sure that we had Bonner Springs and Edwardsville voices at the table, that we needed to have, have those voices there. Uh, I don't know to what extent the next round of funding will, will be. I know the State Finance Council met yesterday. I believe there's an additional $75 million coming. Now, I, I will state, uh, Mr. Webb gave a, a pretty good overview of that. There was $67 million in requests for only $32 million that came available to Wyandotte County. And that money, the, the $100 per person at the Unified Government, put out, that was fair and equitable across the board. That's one I did not have a problem with. But they started talking about the not-for-profits. It took me a little bit to understand, and I believe uh, one of your council members had uh, sent an email to the Unified Government requesting some clarification. So uh, I am really trying to share with you that I have been involved and in understanding of the situation. The uh, the $9 million to the not-for-profits, I don't think it was quite nine, I think it was about 6.7. Yeah, so we're just rounding off, just rounding off dollar. But those not-for-profits, a lot of them provided services that could not be provided because we didn't have the resources. We as governments didn't have the resources to do it. So we wanted to ensure that they were made whole to keep those services rolling out. And when I say we, the, com the committee that made those decisions chose to do so. The, the business aspect for small businesses, those monies, if I remember correctly, the committee chose to send those monies back to the local units of government so that the local units of government could determine which businesses in their communities they wanted to allocate those dollars to. So you know your business partners in your community better than other commissioners do. You're, you're the appointed body. So that was one of the other decisions. I will share with you that it, this is all very fluid. It happened quickly. 
and it needs to be those dollars need to be spent you cannot use these dollars to supplant budget items all you can use them for is covid related issues and incidents uh, i think there may be a little i don't want to call it wiggle room but our opportunity to be creative in how those dollars are used as we move forward but my advice would be it, it, it's a good thing you accepted those dollars not knowing when the second round and the third round is going to come but it, back to the question that was posed will there be changes i think now that we see some of the changes necessary to make this program more equitable i think those voices uh, should be loud and clear but as your commissioner at large i want you to know i, I wanted to attend this evening knowing this was on the agenda i attended the one in bonner and heard their concerns they're very parallel uh, if I could have been king for a day, uh, I should commit to you that you'd have had a strong voice on that on that committee. So, Mayor, I also I just want to say I'm also here. I said on the I was appointed to the Kansas Economic Recovery Committee. I'll be in Topeka the rest of the week and also meeting with the uh, Secretary of Commerce for Development. And I do know you development is very important to this community, knowing some of the challenges we all have in this particular pandemic. But I'm also here to share with you that. You have a partner here, I'm very bullish on economic development. If there's any way that I can help, particularly when it comes to Starbond or and, and or identifying partners in your community, please reach out to me, I'm, I'm here to do so. And you don't have to wait to reach out to me. I'll, I'll be keeping <coughs> in touch. I talked with Mike and, and Mayor, I see yourself and other commissioners or other committee members at the, uh, in the community. So with that, I'll stand for any questions. Mayor, thank you for the opportunity to present this evening. Thank you for coming, Tom. Appreciate Commissioner it. slash uh, State Rep. Uh, Burroughs, I have a quick question. On that uh, fundings uh, round two and three, and, and maybe you both of them, uh, will that um, board, that committee, be in place, or will there be a, a new board form, or uh, do we know? How, I mean, at the end of, because you were on it, right. I mean, did they say that you will be on the next well, one. Well, as I understand it, and, and the commissioner made it from the state side, so round two, that funding was a direct, you made direct application to the state okay. for those funds. Okay. I will say that there was a, I'll call it a joint application that was done with the UG specifically for uh, fiber access. And, right. and effectively, it was to get fiber to public facilities in Bonner. And, and to Edwardsville, so to connect down into our two communities. That's all been, the, the UG handled that with their partner, or UPN, I guess the right third party fiber provider. That was, was made, I think, well, our uh, chamber made some, and I don't know. The chamber made some, and the city put some through that we talked about at the last meeting, and like Mike said, that's being completely administered by the state, and as far as I understand, okay. there's no local body. And that's right. why, I mean, I think yeah. we're kind of Going yeah. up and during, I don't know the third round. round is. So, if there is another round, let me put it this way. I'll make it. So I'll read, read, uh, read direct, or how I'm going to ask this question. And if there's additional um, boards, will you be on that, or have you been asked, or do you even know? And so, I will have to go into a whole big long discussion. That if there is, Commissioner, I would like to that we uh, be known about that in advance, so that we can request through um, Doug Bach, or Administrator Bach, or whoever makes those decisions on who will be on those boards that um, we would like to um, help name some representation. I think that's a fair request, uh, Mr. Stites. I, I, would, I, I can't state if the committee will be the same committee. I, I didn't have that authority to begin with that was uh, produced that committee was established by the mayor and it happened quite rapidly and uh, we didn't have too much opportunity to change it as i said this care funding was pretty fluid pretty quick there was a lot of questions i can't tell you how many hours i spent on zoom with the federal level as well as the governor's office listening to questions come from local units of government can i use this money for this can we use it for that and there was comments that were made that we just need to get the money in the hands, get it, get it rolling, and then we will see how the federal government chooses to back off. I will state that any monies that are misappropriated, the city has to pay that back to the feds. And so that's why it needed to be approved by the state 
And uh, if those programs aren't approved by the state, then they won't get the funding. But uh, I did hear your message this evening. You have, uh, I, I believe you're accurate in your comments and your statements. And I'll just leave it at that. Well, I, and I, I don't know how it is that if you guys report back uh, uh, to, to Mayor Alvey, you know, if you guys, when you guys have meetings or whatever, and if he asks, uh, um, so, uh, Commissioner Burroughs, what's going on in Edwardsville? <laughs> you know, that I would hope that uh, that what we have relayed tonight um, uh, gets relayed to him through you. Thank you. Message received. I appreciate you. And, and thank you for your courtesy this evening and your professional courtesy. And if you ever make your way to Topeka, the office is always available and it's yours. I'm not in it very much. I'm usually on the floor in committee, so you have a place to. You know, rest, use phone, put your books, whatever you need, office is yours. When, when Mayor Alvey was here, my request was that Edwardsville have at least two representatives on any committee that affects our citizens. How was that received, if you don't mind me asking? Yeah, he had a bit of non-committal. Well, we only have one. Yeah, that was, and, and so, if, if our citizens are being affected, they need to be represented by the people they elected to represent them or a staff member that works on their behalf. Mr. Adams, I do not disagree with you. As a member of this community, we're all, uh, I'll borrow your words, we're all very equal and we should be treated fair and equitable across, across the board throughout our community. Um, as I stated, you have every right to feel the way you do, and you're not the only governing body that feels that way on the south side of the river, west of 435. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. You bet. Appreciate it. Advisory report, Mike, you're on board. Uh, quick. A couple items. Oh. One, just in response to uh, okay. the, the, the CARES Act committee is still a, a group, a committee, and as we, as they do, like in September, there will be, a, I think it's near the end of September, there's a report that has to be made uh, that's required reporting, and so that group is still interacting. I was on the call this evening for the, uh, uh, the committee report. So, you know, the UG has various, uh, various committees. So I listened in on that uh, as what was going on in the Players Act. So staying engaged in I, just, I don't know that there will be any, any actions unless there are funds that are not allocated for some reason, then those have to go back to that committee for review. Uh, just uh, kind of follow up to some of the county stuff. Uh, as you know, uh, we uh, I, I kept kind of pestering through the health department about pop-up testing or testing in our community. Uh, ultimately, was connected through uh, the I think it was uh, Vibrant Health to Heart to Heart International, uh, who has agreed that they're going to do two testing dates here in the city, a Thursday, uh, like a four to seven, and then the Friday. Uh, we're also working kind of with the school and the mobile home park and others, and we will get that word out very broadly. And uh, and they, you do not have to be uh, symptomatic for that test. So unlike what's going on in the health department, uh, anybody can come. And quite honestly, I think I would encourage people to attend as I recall, the one test that was done, the testing site over at the business park, they had 30 attendees and, and zero positive tests. What we weren't able to, to determine was what was the residency, which was a white dot, but what county at least. I, I, you know, uh, I will tell you, heart to heart keeps pretty in-depth statistics that they're going to pass on to us because part of it is uh, engaged through KU in a nationwide study related to COVID and COVID testing and percentage. So uh, I think that will be good. So help us get the word out. Uh, this past week, we had bond rating call. Uh, as you know, we have new bonds to be issuing, I think, in our next meeting is the sales. Uh, I have not heard back from the bond rating agency. Uh, they asked most of the typical questions. Uh, you know, they certainly had some input or concern about what was, you know, economic development, what was going on. Obviously, they were aware of what was happening at the hotel, uh, so they had some questions about that and if there was anything unusual. Uh, they asked about our financial policies. They did ask about 
you know, maintaining our, our reserve funds and where we were at and what we were playing, which again, I, I fully anticipated that. So uh, we sent them copies of some budget materials that those questions. So a fairly straightforward bond rating call. So hopefully we will hear from them. Uh, you know, I think uh, what we would hope for is a, to maintain our current bond rating. I can tell you a number of communities have had downgrades, mainly because of COVID and some of their uh, dependency on sales taxes. I think they were impressed that, uh, you know, financially uh, we were stable in making all our payments, we were doing all the things we were supposed to do, uh, that we over time have taken a pretty uh, slow grow approach and, and, and not not depending on revenues that we've not seen yet. Uh, as a matter of fact, we make several points about that, but we don't spend money we don't have. And I think that was good. Uh, the uh, on the Riverview Crossroad project, uh, we'll be issuing out the proposals for clearing of the trees. I think we have, I believe we have everybody signed up. Uh, but the, the the tree clearing has to occur so the utilities can go in. So because the utilities have to relocate or they like to relocate before the project bids. Very similar to what we did on Kansas Avenue. No Kansas Avenue, for those that were here, we had to clear at a certain time of year because of the brown bat or some bat who yeah, then the next the bat, year they yeah, said, no, the bat's not in eastern Kansas, it's in western Kansas. And now apparently the bat doesn't exist at all. Uh, so we don't have to worry about bats as we're clearing the trees. And then the last item that I have uh, is I wanted to give you a little thought process so uh, m myself and Dusty have been kind of thinking about after the council meeting and, and the discussions we had, kind of, uh, kind of a, a, a plan of action here. And so that way we'll be coming back to you on a regular basis. But just to give you an idea, so in the next 30 days, some of this we're already working on, we'll be doing those kind of road repair or cutting out sections, replacing sections, doing those things. Of course, we have one major street project. Uh, we're going to be updating the PACER rating. Uh, we have a number of different sources of information, but want to get that back to you so you can see the overall rating of the entire city. And does that PACER rating come with a cost? Uh, it did initially. Uh, we hired, uh, it was combined with BHC Roads and uh, what's his name? Was Norm, 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 Norm Bauer. Norm Bauer, who used to be uh, a county engineer and then so, so there I don't remember what the cost was it wasn't I'm going to say under $10,000 it then, wasn't under $10,000 no so I said I think it was under $10,000 and then you can update it as you go the county also did a uh, they did a mobile rate where they drive a truck down every street and they have sensors and then from the sensors they make determinations and so we we have that data uh, it's getting that data into a you know, form that, that works that we can relate to. So, uh, and then when I say engage engineering, we we had in our 2019 bonds, we put money aside for 98th Street kind of preliminary engineering, specifically for Kansas Avenue up to the city limits. But after our discussion, I think what we're going to do is uh, modify that scope and, and if, so we may do a little less intense work but, but do the full corridor of 98th Street and engage the engineer so get the surveying work out of the way you know work on some of the street section options those kind of things that we can bring back to you also you have a, a broader picture of it. so we're not going to be doing design work but more the broader picture so where are the cost issues where are the you know, what are the things we need to do? So, you know, we probably have to break that up in the project and give you some of, of that there. So we hope within 90 days to come back with that study, we call it the 98th Street study. We also talk about adopt road section plans and policies. So as part of that, we're going to be looking at options, so different types of road options, and also use that to incorporate into a complete street plan. So. I know y'all have heard that a lot. It's a policy we need to have as it relates to funding. But again, our complete street plan may not be the same, you know, wouldn't be the same as a legal plan, right? So, so what do we want in our policy? It still has to meet certain requirements. 
but let's get our own in there. Uh, and of course, Public Works will be doing normal fall maintenance activities and then some of that getting ready for winter activities, which we all know what that means. Uh, hopefully not much of it. And then what we'd like to do at around the six month mark is take all that information and put together a true five year CIP for our streets. So, you know, we've used the pace rating, we've done some general policies, but have it in a form where we can say this year it's a million dollars, and next year it's this and this, and put that as part of our financial plan. And obviously that would be about the same time we'd be issuing 2021 road project, whatever those may be. I'll just finish with saying that our application to, to MARP, uh, we had two applications, as you recall, one was from 98th Street from Kansas to the North City Limits. That one got highly aligned, which is the highest rating you can get from some committees. Uh, and then the other one was for sidewalk connections to the park. Originally, it got uh, from basically here to, to the park. So as you know, we get a lot of people that walk up the damn Blank Street with have trucks and all kinds of other things. It's a, they wanted to see more focus on sidewalks, so not trails, not, you know, not major things. But so we're looking at sidewalk and on-street bike lanes. Uh, fairly small project as things go. Uh, originally, it got rated, it got incomplete because there's some application questions because remember they do these applications and we put non not applicable because they weren't applicable but apparently not applicable means that you didn't answer the question so we went back and we answered the question by saying this doesn't apply to us and that made it complete so uh, that's I mean I just have a great application process let's go so there's nothing to do so that's kind of the thing. Uh, obviously, Dusty's kind of more behind the scenes on, on actually out there cutting up roads and putting pavement down and getting the crews doing things. But he and I are kind of working on, on trying to you know, put some meat around this concept. So I just wanted to give you that update. And uh, that way, you, you know, you won't have to ask every meeting where are we at, where are we at, where are we at. We want to kind of say, this is where we'll be coming back to you in about 30 days. We're in the next 30 days, probably to engage the engineer maybe at the next meeting. And by the end of 90 days, we hope we have these pieces done by the end of 180. Not to say we won't have any in between, but just so you have an idea of what we're doing over the next six months in this area. Hey, how do we coordinate with the unified government on, so we're talking about 98th Street, that being highly aligned. Right. Well, they that only means 2I-70, because that's what's in our city, 98th Street from Kansas Avenue up to I-70. Right. So, I mean, uh, uh, thinking ahead here, and, and so here we have this nice road from Kansas Avenue north all the way to I-70, and then it's reverts back right. to what 98th <coughs> Street is currently. Right. So, I mean, is there uh, thoughts that we um, work with the unified government to let them know where we're at in this, or do they know where we're at in this process, and that maybe our timelines, they align up, that, uh, you know, I mean, it would seem right. like we would want 98th Street to be completed from State Avenue all the way down. Well, so, in the, in the our regional plan, the 20 KC 2050, is that what it's called? I believe. So, in that, when we did that, we actually the project from 2050 is K32 to State Avenue. Actually, is the is the full project. This is a piece there. Right. Uh, we've been having, and, and especially west has been having uh, more contacts and engagements with the public work side of the house over over there. Uh, Jeff Fisher and I have talked about even this particular item, you know, not on a regular basis, but we have discussed it in the past. So yes, we'll we'll keep them engaged uh, because there's also I think, you know, a sewer line up there that I know they're just you know working through. Well, I know the water street. And, and there's even street. south on the south end with BPU water. I mean, they want to upgrade that water line, but they've somewhat held off because we were talking about doing something with that road. Well, and there's a question about realigning 98th Street um, behind the truck uh, facility right. that's there and realigning that up with the new 98th Street, which right. isn't so new now anymore, right. but the, the, the right. 98th maybe Street is there. So maybe that uh, those those talks uh, can happen. Yeah, and, I'm, and 
I know the UT also has applications, Jeff and I both serve on the SDP committee, uh, so we will be seeing each other quite a bit. The, the, the process of selecting projects is now kind of in, in, in the time. So everything's filed, everything's in. The staff at Mark starts reviewing all those applications, then we get scores, then we kind of go in and, and fight for everybody's, you know, there's, you know, there's $12 million per year, and there's $40 million worth of projects a year. That's kind of how, you know, it's about three to one, 36 to 40 for each year, uh, for roughly 12, 12 and a half million dollars, unless the feds finally decide to actually fund the, uh, fund the uh, actual infrastructure plan for more than a year at a time. But it won't be happening in the next 12 months, that I know. Or I'll be really surprised. That's all I have tonight, Mayor, unless there's other questions. Jack, do you have anything to comment? Uh, I do just have three quick dates I do want to put on your radar. October 1st, the Chamber is going to be hosting uh, Kansas Secretary of Commerce, David Tolan, in a, a kind of a webinar that the Chamber folks will facilitate from 11.30 to 12.30. And so if you're interested, just let me know. We're going to try and shoot out information that can get uh, plugged into that for our local businesses and the businesses over at Bonner. Um, LKM, if you've not seen information come out yet, um, they're still moving forward with their uh, annual conference. It's going to be taking place completely virtually. Um, so if you've not seen information from that, I'll, I'll, I'll be sending out information that LKM sent out so you get a sense of the agenda. We will then be selecting our voting delegates for the business meeting portion of that. That's October 13th through the 16th. And then the next month, uh, what we've decided on, the concept for our uh, citywide cleanup, and we shared this with the CPPS board last week, uh, Obviously, we couldn't hold it under the concept that we usually run with in the spring. We kind of were holding out that maybe we could hold some kind of event in October. Um, that's not panning out. So rather than having the event where we have 40 yard containers stationed out at City Hall, we scheduled a, a bulky item pickup day. And waste management will have uh, teams of trucks on Saturday, November 14th, essentially sweeping the entire neighborhood. And what we're doing, we're going to get the word out in our next utility building that residents are encouraged to put out two to three bulky household items for pickup and we're kind of nailing down on, on some of the particulars of that but no construction items nothing with freon no hazardous materials kind of no tires you know some of the boilerplate stuff uh, but november 14th is the date to circle in your calendar for bulky item pickup and that's all i've got Zach, i had a question about that um i saw it on the hot shot and i had a few people um comment to uh -huh. me because they were a lot of folks members will use that not to just throw in bulky stuff but they clean out their garages they clean out their shed it's more than just right. a couch or, or what have you um on the hot shot it said due to county restrictions we couldn't have it which county restrictions well just largely the, the overarching count public health restrictions as far as gathering goes i believe the 45 person limit is there's there's still some limit to the mass gathering of it and if I were to ask the public health official over at the county, I would say that I, I'm pretty confident in the fact that they would tell us that gathering that many people and sifting through essentially garbage is, is not going to be a allowable event in the city and within one that county. Probably within an advisable so event. When I had been there the last few years, people would pull their vehicle up and if they couldn't just, so you're saying someone couldn't drive their own vehicle empty their own stuff into a container and drive out. I mean, we, we, we talked about that as a concept. There would still need to be some level of supervision, and that's all of the, the participation that the city staff does and the elected officials do is all voluntary. And what we want to do is discourage as much. I think the volunteers have a pretty big role. I mean, it's, it's not often that somebody comes and completely self-sufficient in, in getting rid of their items into the into the container and also there's a level of we don't we need to have some level of of monitoring and supervision of that what is going on and logistically it's becoming more and more difficult on top of that waste management they had some the representatives i spoke to over there also have some just additional safety concerns for their folks and the delivery of it and all that 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 they have been more comfortable this is the model that they recommended us going forward. With so they didn't feel like it was safe to drive their trucks and drop off the container? That's uh, uh, apparently not. 
I will say we are out for bid on our garbage box. Okay, that's good. I just, I mean, it, that doesn't. I, I appreciate that you're just the messenger. I, I understand that. I was just wondering, because I usually that's a pretty social distance type of event. There's not 45 people gathered together ever in a tight space there. Um, the primary concern was the dis. I mean, the one thing having masks on, uh, scheduling it being I mean, with the weather starting to, to turn. So either people would have masks on all the time, or they wouldn't, and that level of kind of close interaction, I think, was an area between, say, the volunteers and the people coming in, if we were to keep it under the same concept that we've had in the past. Okay. I mean, I don't, I, I understand what you're saying, being there in the past, I don't think I was ever within six feet of another person and loading their, their stuff. I pulled stuff out of people's trucks and was fine doing it again this year to serve our community. I, I feel like, personally, I, I would have liked to have been privy to the decision before it was made. Um, I personally would have been happy to show up and help out. I still would. Um, I think that's a once a year thing that our community really benefits from. And I appreciate that we're at least doing the free bulky items, but I'd like to see if it's possible. Well, I'd like to know what additional cost that is to our city since they're driving around and picking it up. But then if there's anything we can offer for smaller items to be collected. We're going to be trying to backfill some of those other supplemental areas, like the, 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 uh, um, Citywide garage sale portion of it. We're going to try and find a date in October to, to have that. Try to find an outlet for some of the donated items. Have some kind of maybe we can host a drive at the community center through um, Adelante. We'll reach out to them. Um, the e waste is a big area because that has been used a lot, like about on average four, four and six tons. The last couple years have introduced that. Waste management can take e waste. It's not, you know, it's not uh, encouraged. Uh, and there's some items that some of the older computer monitors they just can't take because of the hazardous material. But we're trying to backfill those other kind of items outside of this dumping the big stuff in between now and that, that November 14th day. Okay, um, please, you know, please keep us posted on yeah. that. I think that would be beneficial. Thank you, Dagwood. Chief Um Just a note, uh, we, we submitted. Uh, and we do every year, our justice assistance grants. We don't submit directly to the federal government. We go through the state allocation. In some places, such as larger, such as Casey Day, we have a direct application to the, to the federal government. So we're just a little different from our size. And we submitted over $60,000 in request for equipment. And we were at the award decision meeting at the state capitol. And we were awarded our full funding amount we're replacing our mobile data terminals and our police cars. They're now going by December seven years old, just getting dated. And we, we're acquiring a license plate uh, reader, an automated license plate reader. And so those are the two things that we encompass in that in that grant funding. And partly there's some restrictions on kind of the boundaries of what you can ask for. And those were certainly with, well within the, the parameters of the world. So uh, we, were, we were aligned with the funding, the statewide funding goals or objectives. So that's, of oh, note, that's it. Uh, there's some tires on 94th if you haven't seen them. They were dumped. Uh, we discovered them a couple of days ago. Uh, and Zach Daniel sent us a uh, message that maybe, maybe they've gotten the point. We have been in contact with this owner before, and they live in Texas in a very rural area has a full voicemail, so we've, we've been trying to hunt them down to see whether or not that's something they authorize, because we don't know when it's on their property, so if you're seeing that, uh, we, we, have, we presume uh, they're probably not uh, supposed to be there, but it's on private property, so then we're gonna work out uh, maybe a, what, a cleanup effort if we need to, but we need to talk to the property owner first, and we just haven't heard back from them yet, so. Thanks, Steve. Short sure, please. Uh, just two things. One, uh, I'll be leaving on vacation on Wednesday. We'll not be back till next week, so then we'll be in charge of the farm while I'm gone. Two, as part of the CARES funding at the federal level, it did not go take down the states. Uh, there was a second funding opportunity through FEMA through the Assistance to Firefighters Grant for PPE related specifically to COVID-19. That window will open up. In October, 
it is only for a combination of volunteer departments. So us being a, a combination department, we are pursuing, <coughs> excuse me, some COVID-19 PPE funding to back through that. Uh, however, it's a small amount of money going to the AFG, and it's still a competitive bid process. That is still split over the time I told you. Chief, was there anything else from the uh, on the county emergency management side that they were doing kind of a separate? They're still working on a Stafford Act um, declaration. However, that still has not come to the Senate or uh, House um, at the federal level on how they're going to address the Stafford Act disaster uh, declaration proclamation over funding. Um, that's been the problem. It's usually Typically, you have that disaster funding that comes through that side. Uh, the pandemic, they ran through the CARES Acts, the HEROES Acts, and everything else. That was still being debated at this time. We made application through that process, too. So. Thank you, Chief. Dusty? I think we covered it all. Okay. Thank you. Chief Whitter, thank you very much for working with, with KCK on, on the mutual aid agreement. That, that is exactly the type of thing that would be great if we had in all departments and all parts of the county, all departments in, in the county. So uh, I really appreciate your work on that. I know, I know that's been a long process. I appreciate that. Um, I would like to uh, echo uh, Councilman Kahar's feelings about Big Trash Day. I don't see that we congregate 45 people uh, within any distance at all. And so, I, I, without getting too opinionated, uh, I think we have hyper-reacted to everything. I know at the bottom of everything is no turn. And so if we're doing that for to keep the, the liability off our back, okay, whatever. But, but it is a vital part of our community. And it's been around for longer than I've been around, and so uh, I, I'm disappointed that we we did we are not moving ahead with that. There's an opportunity to do that. I think we should try to consider that. So I have to. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, thank you to both of our chiefs for applying for grants. That is fantastic. Saves us tax dollars. Um, and we need to make every bit go as far as we can. And so um, it, it is great representation for departments. Um, Mike, I wanted to ask you, we talked before about as we're getting to know more about COVID-19 and about um, how that's affecting our community. CDC came out over a week ago, said over 94% of reported deaths um, were folks with comorbidities, 94%, a huge amount. And so I feel like hopefully our uh, health officials are taking into consideration how that would affect folks that are otherwise healthy. And um, I was wondering, I know we talked a while back a few times about finding out what is our benchmark, what is our goal, um, what are the exact numbers, what are we working for to step down and step down and um, open more things up and not continue on um, all the requirements and the limitations. Did, did you ever find out or ask if there Well, actually the mayor was... raised that on a call after our last council meeting and we didn't really get much of a clear answer of who can bring it up again. I mean, okay. it was, well, we're still, you know, we're still peaking at, you know, 16% or whatever, whatever. And I, I think one of the challenges is, and I would say I the health department agrees, is you know, the base is not the same. So, you know, we look at the U.S. and it's 5.5, you know, percent or 6 percent testing rate, but they're testing broadly. Where really in Wyandotte County, except the KU Hospital, all tests are still to simple that. Right. right. So the number comes down because KU Hospital is testing so anybody that comes to the hospital for a procedure or for an in-hospital stay has to be tested, right? That's part of that. And so 
I, we don't have really a breakdown of so how is KU Hospital preparing to, to the county at the, at the We know what the county, the county is generally two or three percentage points higher than the overall testing rate, but again, they're testing only. I think that will be one of the benefits, quite honestly, of having testing here that is for anybody that wants to drive up. And we will be encouraging people to participate in because I think it's important for us as a community to know that, even as an organization to know that, right? Is, is uh, I mean, if we have people that are asymptomatic and positive, well, we certainly want to know that, not from you know, health internally, but, uh, you know, I think there was even some discussions around what about doing uh, you know, uh, antibody testing. You know, and so, uh, I, as a reference, got antibody testing and I was negative, even though I know I was in close proximity to a person that was positive. So, yeah. Well, and I think it's important with something that is a virus, right. um, and I'm, I'm not a doctor, right. but people are going to get it, and the more time goes on, the more numbers are going to go up, and especially if most of our testing is for symptomatic um, individuals. But when we're looking at the hospital, so the people that are affected most negatively are getting hospitalized or, or dying from it in those rates. Are, are a little easier to track than we're normally testing symptomatic. And so I, I'm not going to say this is what when they should do what, but I, I think it would be easier for everyone if we had a benchmark. This is the number we're aiming for. Whether, it doesn't matter what, what our tests are now, but this is the number we're aiming for. And when we hit this level, then we can look at moving down instead of just a gray area. Would, that would be really helpful. We will ask that specific question about what you know, what is the benchmark to to the next step being. I, I do think that question has been broadly asked without a specific answer. And I appreciate that you guys are bringing it up and, yeah. and that you'll continue to. Um, just three days ago was September 11th. And um, I think that it would be, I think it's a good opportunity for us to appreciate our first responders and um, I don't know if, if this is something we would do on a, a government level it might be we have proclamations that we read once in a while um, to involve Patriot Day in that but I think it's a great time to remember um, the sacrifices that our police fire and EMT are making on a day-to-day -day basis and um, wanted to be sure to do that this evening so thank you guys I really Mr. Mullen. Well, I'd love to say now. Mm -hmm. I haven't said three words to that. Thank you, Commissioner, for being here and looking forward to your representing us forcefully at the county level because we all feel the same. I try not to say too much because I have a, have a coming back backfire on me when I complain about that. But thank you for that. Thank you, uh, Chief Whittem for the mutual aid agreement. I think with KCK, that's really been a long time coming, and I hope that it works out, because I've seen it where it didn't work out so well, and I think that's really a good thing. Checks and balances, I wanted to make sure, you know, that it was mentioned that make sure you spend the money on what it's allocated sure. for. Don't veer off of that, and I just wanted to make sure that we were very careful about that. We really can't afford to give any money back. And the other thing would be on, uh, when we're talking about taser ratings and all that, on the streets, I had some phone calls on all that rain last week about Newton Avenue flooding pretty bad, and I'd like to have some evaluations done on that, see if there's anything we could do to relieve some of that on Newton Street. I know there's a lot of drainage and whistles, I call them, that go on the driveway, so aren't there or plugged up entirely. But I think we need to spend a little bit of time down in the old town area on that too. So with that, I'm um, going to thank Margaret. Thank Chief Whittem, Chief of Facebook, you all your hard work. I am um, would ask, I I'm not quite sure when I asked about if we have a mutual aid agreement with Bonner. Do we have one? 
If 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 not, can we get one? Yes, ma'am. We, we we were talking about that. We we're Your just we're making scary. sort of verify because we did a, a some, we've done some things in writing. We just want to make sure that what we have covers everything. We want to have a, sure. a, a life agreement. You, yeah. Your example is. Right. So we, we know we have. And if we're going out there as often, right. or often, yeah. um, if we ever go out there, we need to have that. Yes. Right. So we want to have a written formalized yeah. agreement. That's our best. Well, sure. We have a couple that we have done um, as part of not only the federal grants um, that we successfully got for two years ago, um, we've also had another one that was done in my time. Um, if it is not to the part of this one, we'll be back in front of this council to. Best one for Bonner Springs, um, but on that point, our working relationship with Bonner um, in the six years I've been here has been excellent. Um, part of that has been because it was driven because of the lack of aid from other personnel. Um, I know that through our conversations, all three chiefs have been set down before, so we've got a whole new, uh, different aspect of how we're looking at things, especially in the southwestern portion of Wyandotte County. Not only with two small communities of Bonner and Edwardsville, but even on the western side of Blind Doctor, there's not a large, significant force um, for KCK fire. So there are just only so many resources that are out here. So we, we are looking at that for sure that uh, it's not the same standard we'll back in front of this council. Thank you. Um, one other thing that I wanted to mention is that. I know it's been a couple meetings ago, there was a instant brought up about um, the dispatch. Was there confusion or was there about the child that was missing and the yes. dispatch call? I think all that's been Has resolved. that been resolved? I mean, it was, it was a little alarming to think that Maybe yeah. a dispatch call didn't come in. I, I don't know which one of the chiefs. Specifically, I had a conversation with the KCK fire dispatch supervisor and the fire chief last Tuesday. Um, part of that was driven because of the incident with the child in the river. Um, what has transpired out of that? Um, KCK fire dispatches by actual, this is the reported incident location and that is how they dispatch. PD is dispatched from the PD side and there is a slight deviation in how PD is associated and assigned the resources to it. Part of uh, mutual agreement, part of just the change has been a more open avenue to communications with that. So anything that's close to on the border, um, they're going to sit there and try to, to do a little more due diligence to ensure that you know if we can be there a little bit quicker that we're notified just as soon uh, as PD is as well. Uh, but what, what we have is two different dispatch systems going on and. They're both regulated by their own separate entities down there, and that's where the problem gets into the, the lack of or the miscommunication of who's sitting and who wants. Mm -hmm. And that's why we have 435 where you may have an Edwardsville police officer that gets dispatched because the time the police department's got the information, it's 435 and Kansas Avenue. As to where when it comes in on the fire side, they got the calls 435 on holiday, and that's the assignment to Casey. So that's why there's that direction. And like I said, part of our uh, meeting we had was to start clearing a lot of that up. Okay. So it's still in work in progress. Yeah, it's a very it's a very dynamic work in progress, but we've got some open line of communication with it. Okay, perfect. Commissioner Burroughs, thank you. Thank you so much. Like everybody said, hopefully you take our our thoughts, our suggestions, our concerns back to the commission and our voice be heard down there. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Sure. Um, well, uh, Commissioner Burroughs, one of the things that we had recommended um, and that we had talked about, and it happened, I guess, prior to uh, me being elected here, was that there was a supposedly some sort of a meeting that was uh, had by. Um, Edwardsville elected, KCK, uh, uh, UG elected, and Bonner elected, set in a, in a, in a room and, and, had a, and had a meeting. And I think that that is, um, 
and I don't know we've at, I don't know we where that actually went. So we brought that up, and I, it's kind of I've never heard another word about it. Um, I think that when you when you bring those people in a room in a gathering, you eat, you break bread, and you talk and discuss and cuss and get things done. I think that's how you really forge relationships that you know people say, man, you know what? I like those guys, but we like you guys. You know, we're able to exchange phone numbers and talk. And I would really like to see, and I'm just educating you on what we have asked. Um, I would like, and I'm asking tonight, that we do what we have to do uh, to have get that meeting um, on the on the books. And I know that that's not an e probably an easy task with the, everybody's schedules, but I mean. Um, you have to start somewhere, and if we don't uh, start by asking, um, it will never happen. I'll, so. st I'll, I'll start by uh, contacting my two fellow city managers at least tomorrow and, and start kicking, the, kicking that ball and, and we'll, we'll see how that, that grows. And, okay. And the mayors during their, Perfect. they have their mayor's meetings, maybe that can be discussed there too. Well, obviously. Here in the yeah, any, anybody that uh, um, has the ear of other um, electeds, you know, that's easy to, uh, to present that to them. Um, where are we at on uh, the trash pickup for the uh, community service, the courts issuing community service for people to be picking up trash? I, I don't know if they've sit in the story, if, they, if anybody has uh, participated, I'd have to follow up with the judge. So can we get an update on what the process is, what is supposed to happen? Because um, we haven't really... I mean, well, so, so the process is if somebody comes before the court and uh, uh, they either, for whatever reason, can't, can't pay their fine, so not the court fee, but the fine part, then they have this opt-out to sign documents, right? So they can participate in the program to uh, whether pick up trash or, or do other chores of, along those ways. So they, they sign in for that. They then uh, contact uh, the city uh, to schedule their time. And then they do their work and then they get credit for that time. They get ten dollars an hour credit for their time back against the funds. I just don't know if the, the court has. They have all the information. They have all the stuff. I just have to follow back up with the judge and the prosecutor to see who has. I don't know anybody that had like, failed with it, but they've only had one court day since we put that in. So I, I, I just have to follow up. With that. I just don't know the answer to that. All right. Um. So north of I-70, which I know that this is going to be in uh, KCK now, on 98th Street, if you guys have driven there, three weeks ago I called the UG to tell them about 20 bags of trash that was dumped under I-70. Um, I was told that they'd be out there the next day. That's been three weeks. Um, now there's a, a couch. And from, I'm talking from State Avenue down to I-70. Now there's a couch and no less than 10 tires that have been dumped, um, along with the 20 bags of uh, black trash bags that are under the bridge. Um, so I know that that's our border and such, and that's why I called uh, KCK uh, Public Works to let them know. And I'm, and Commissioner, I'm not getting anywhere. It's been three weeks, and uh, so if you m might be able to help out on that. I did see what happened up there. I, I, I drove up that way to take it up. Well, I didn't know where the sewer. Like, <laughs> oh, no, no, I, I saw it out. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's it's a little a little further north. north right. um, and they um, there was also a uh, just just at that cell tower site there was a. Uh, uh, a Polaris ATV that was recovered, stolen, that was dumped right there also. So, um, it's coming a little dump spot up there. Um, and then, there's one up there. So, um, Commissioner, I appreciate being here, and uh, um, uh, hopefully that uh, we can 
we can uh, move forward and, and uh, the communication will help and, and uh, get some things resolved and move forward. Thank you much. That's all. Thank you. Um, I will make a, a, a comment about the uh, COVID reporting. Um, now on our calls, we get a we get a, uh, a detailed report from KU, uh, which is Wyandotte County, which is, and that was from my request. So we get we get some information. Um, I'm not sure that we get anything like that from Providence, because there's a possibility that somebody from Leavenworth County is there. But, uh, but in KU, uh, the reports are always including what, how many are from Wyandotte County. So. And it's probably, if I average them, about a third of yeah. the total yeah. cases. Yeah. It varies, but I would say about a third are, are generally Wyandotte County related. Mm -hmm. Um, other than that, thank you all for all your comments. Commissioner Burroughs, thank you once again. And with that, we are adjourned. Exactly.